Okay, Brendan, it's your turn. Thanks, Bill. Don't want no coming that come around. Stay out in orbit like a guy for a clown. You made me laugh. Talk of the town, you made me love you. You made me cry. I'm home in the morning, face full of frown. You broke apart, and now you're dimming down. You made me love you. Now I have to go switch to another computer, um, but enjoy the show. Okay, welcome to All Space Considered. I believe I'm unmuted, am I not? Yay, David, Tony, Patrick, you guys can unmute. Um, it's 731, so I think we're about to start our program here. Um, I am, uh, I am Dr. Laura Danley. I'm the curator of Griffith Observatory and your usual host for All Space Considered, along with Dr. David Reitzel, uh, our astronomical lecturer, Tony Cook, our astronomical observer, and Patrick So, our astronomical theater programs manager. So, uh, you know, we're always here on the first Friday of every month to uh, share with you All Space Considered, but um, not this Friday and not, not uh, the first Friday in April either for obvious reasons, right? We're all at home. 
Um, so we're very sad uh, that we can't be together. And uh, so we thought we'd give this a try and see if we can't bring all space considered into your living room nonetheless. And I gotta say, we have never done this before. Um, I am sure there are going to be uh, mess ups. In fact, there already are mess ups. Um, so uh, <laughs> we're just gonna do our best. Um, so anyway, uh, with that, let me, um, let me tell you a little bit, uh, about what you just heard. You know, usually, um, uh, yeah, no. Okay. Uh, we have, um, usually we do announcements like, where did you hear about us? And, uh, how, uh, you know, how many times have you been here before? But we can't do any of that because we can't see any of you. So instead, we're just going to jump straight to what was that music all about? And Bill, uh, can you tell us what uh, what was that all about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I sure can. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I had to run from my studio here. I'm sorry. I'm a little out of breath. So tonight, as always, we will be playing our music game during the course of this presentation. Regulars already know the rules, but they have been adjusted to our Current circumstances. Um, we played, as you saw and heard, three pieces of music on the stream prior to the show. Every, each of those pieces of music is somehow connected to at least one story we are presenting. If you guess that connection, you win a prize. To make a guess, include the name or, or some identifier of the musical piece that you heard and the story it's connected to, and enter your answer either here in the, the YouTube uh, chat sac section or tweet it at us, tweet it at us, it's hard to say, at all space considered. That's all space and then considered with no vowels in it. Up to two prizes will be awarded for each song, one for the first correct chat and, of course, one for the correct uh, first correct tweet. You can um, wait and pick up your prize at the next all space considered once we do, uh, that we do once the observatory reopens. Or if you'd like, we can pick your prize and mail it to you. We have mission stickers. We have pins, pens, posters, and other assorted uh, fun prizes, including calendars. Now here is an example, I hope you can see it, of a, of a beautifully produced calendar with incredible photos of the observatory, mostly by our, our, our dear friend and brilliant museum guide, Mr. David Pinsky, who I hope is listening. Like all our calendars, it is out of date. This one is from uh, 2019. As you know, though, because I have said this so many times before, uh, a calendar can be used again. For instance, this very beautiful 2019 calendar will be useful again in 2030, just less than a decade away. Just stick it in your sock drawer until December 31st, 2029, and then 2030, you got a calendar. A 2018 calendar is good again in 2029, and a 2017 calendar, uh, its reuse opportunity is right around the corner in 2023. Reduce, reuse, and recycle, and please enjoy the show. Thank you. So uh, yeah, um, Bill told you ways to reach out to us. And in fact, uh, if you're not already there, Matthew, if you can go to the, uh, the PowerPoint screen, you'll see our social media there. Um, so those are all sorts of ways to reach out to us, including an email if you need to. And well, we make requests for people that want to know when their calendar will be good. Will you fill that in for them if they email us? You know, if I have a calendar from 1986, will you tell me when it's good if I send an email to allspaceconsidered at yahoo.com? Yes, I will. I do not have that information on the top of my head, but or but I will get that information to you. Anybody can ask that question, of course. Of course. Awesome. And then we have another way for you to uh, join with us, and that is um, you may have heard Brendan's wonderful uh, blues song, a ballad. I won't tell you unless you were carefully listening to the lyrics so you know which story it's about. But you may have noticed he changed some of the lyrics. So you too can change uh, lyrics to songs. You know, now that we're uh, putting this on YouTube and the walk-in music isn't just in the theater, um, we can't violate copyright. We would never violate copyright. <laughs> no. So, uh, so, you know, we're looking for some creative voices. If you hear a story in the news, an astronomy or space story, and um, you think of a song that you'd like to send to us, uh, we'll take it. And if we, uh, if we play it on our show, we'll even do the story that you selected when you did your song. So, um, you know, the ways in which we can all share things, even though we're all far apart from another, uh, one another, but it's a, you know, it's one of those silver linings. This is an opportunity 
for you to send us some songs and we'll play them in this uh, in this marvelous first class production of ours. Um, so uh, let's see. I think that is mainly most of our intro because I really can't do a whole lot of other things about emergency exits or anything else like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, right. Don't and, go that oh, way. You'll get lost in the catacombs if you try and exit that way. Don't get stuck in the closet that will never be able to get you out. You don't want to do that. So, uh, so instead, um, I'd like to go forward now with a PowerPoint and, um, say on a personal note that today was supposed to be a very special, uh, all space considered. And, uh, we were going to be, um, in uh, collaboration with the LA Opera um, to celebrate their upcoming performance of Peleos and Melisande. And uh, we had special guests, um, Christopher Kelch and James Conlon um, to join us. And then we were going to go into the Planetarium Theater and listen to some of that magnificent um, opera under the stars. So. It's breaking my heart that we can't do that. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful opera and it's breaking my heart that the opera can't be open either. But if you are interested in an incredibly moody, magnificent and, and uh, soulful opera, I recommend you go hear Peleos and Elizond on the internet, of course. Uh, and hopefully someday soon the opera will do it again. So uh, we don't have those guests, but we do have a very special guest today, and uh, that is um, Dr. David Jewett. Dave has been on All Space Considered before. You will, uh, you will recognize him if you've come to our shows before. We even have a little clip of him coming up uh, when he was on that. And he's going to join us because Dave knows all things about all uh, comets, and so um, here are a couple of the stories we're going to be sharing. The first, a tale of three comets. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. And then of course the sky report, uh, maybe there will be a comet to see in the sky, maybe not, it's just hard to say these days. Comets have a mind of their own if they had minds. Um, and then, you know, usually we would take a break and have, um, have some videos, but this time we're not taking a break because, you know, there's no need to, if you need to go, use the facilities, you can just do it. <laughs> we don't need to let you go do it. Um, so we're just gonna push through and tell a couple of great stories of new discoveries, a wonderful pulsar David's gonna tell us about, radio telescope on the moon, that's pretty cool. Um, anyway, you can read them yourself. Uh, and then because we were not able to do it on April uh, 11th, we will be remembering Apollo 13. The 50th anniversary is past. We didn't get to celebrate it together, so we're going to do that tonight. Uh, and a few other headlines, and then some pretty pics, um, pretty pictures, as usual. And then um, uh, if there's time, we'll stick around for some Q&A. But by the way, feel free, you know, you can shout out your questions. <laughs> it won't disturb a thing. Uh, and if you have comments and you disagree with what I'm saying, you just shout it out, it's fine. But another way you can reach us is by typing it into the chat there on YouTube, um, or you can tweet at us, but uh, we have some moderators um, watching the chat right now. And so they will do their best to answer a question. And if they can't answer it, they'll have us answer it. They, they're, uh, they have special means to reach us. So um, with that, I think it's time. Any other introductory comments for the, from the three of you? Or shall I move on to some science? We need to point out the exits. Oh. Yep, right, up that away. And I'll forget the Faraday cage. Up that away, I'm gonna have a lot of pots and pans banging. So <laughs> I, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it on the, but it's quite noisy in my neighborhood, which is a wonderful thing. And that's coming up in just about 20 minutes. So you'll know what's going on if that starts. Um, okay, on with the show. Um, this is just a lovely picture of a comet, um, an artist's rendering of a comet. And, you know, comets, if you've ever seen one in the sky, there have been some pretty dramatic comets, uh, in, at least in my lifetime. And they're breathtakingly beautiful sights. If you are um, uh, uh, superstitious, it might be a terrifying sight for some. And in fact, I gotta say in the beginning of this year when it looked like there was gonna be a very bright comet coming in May, right around the time of the peak of the coronavirus uh, the pandemic, 
Um, I was already, we were already at the observatory getting lots of questions about comets and harbingers of doom and so forth. So I thought, oh no, here we go. <laughs> One of the worst disasters we've had in a long time. And there's gonna be a comet, yay. Um, but uh, we'll tell you more about that. What, what does it mean? Is it a bad omen? Are we, are we hexed by it? One of the things that's kind of amazing about comets is for all their amazing beauty and uh, brilliance, they're actually very, very tiny objects. These are the, uh, that, this is what's down inside the heart of a comet. It's a small little nucleus. And you can see it's only a couple of kilometers across, like not even as big as the city of Los Angeles. This is, um, oh, Bill, you're not here, but uh, Bill would say, Jerisomenko, Cherium of Jerisomenko, and he would say it in a nice Russian accent. That's my, that's my attempt. Um, but you can see that it's, you know, it, it would not be good. They would talk about a harbinger of doom if it fell on us here in Los Angeles, but it's, it's a pretty small object. And yet they're just large, amazing, spectacular objects to see in the sky. So, uh, you know, what is the cause of that? Well, um, the tail is, of course, the material that's being blown off. It's not the comet itself. The comet is teeny tiny. But it, as it comes in the uh, inner solar system, gases boil off and it becomes more brilliant and more spectacular to see. So we're going to tell you some stories about a couple of comets. But first, to set that up, I want to ask the question, and then I'll answer it, where do comets come from? Well, um, in this lovely, perfectly to scale drawing, no, that's a lie. It's not to scale. Um, you can say they've got comets all over the place, and indeed there are lots and lots and lots of comets in the solar system, but they don't, uh, while many of them are in the realm of the planets of the solar system and that part of the solar system in our zone of planets, they actually come from some belts and, uh, and uh, a cloud of comets on the very outskirts of our solar system, but they're still members of our solar system almost all of them, and the, notice the almost. So tonight's story, the tale, that was meant to be funny, it's not really that funny, but anyway, the tale of three comets um, is about three different comets, um, and you'll notice the names, 1i Oumuamua, 2i Borisov, and then C, 2019 Y4 Atlas, comets Atlas. The cool thing is that the I stands for interstellar, if you were not aware of this, we have now detected two comets that are uh, have come from not our solar system at all, but from interstellar space. And those are those two with a letter I in their names. So um, some may say, and properly, that the first one of these, Oumuamua, is quite a mystery. And maybe it's not a comet at all. Maybe, you know, it's, it's some other kind of object, but A Tale of Three Things was not as exciting a title. So we're going back, we're calling it a comet because when it was first detected, it was thought to be a comet. There may be some outgassing. We're gonna ask our guest about that when the time comes uh, that added some changes to its movement. Um, but here it is, that little tiny dot in the center of the blue circle. And it has a, um, an orbit that comes from the outer solar system and brings it, uh, uh, from outside the solar system and brings it past the inner solar system where it then goes flinging back out of our solar system. So it is, it's called a hyperbolic uh, orbit and it's, it's not gonna stick around in our solar system. It's, it's here and gone tomorrow. Now the crazy thing about this object is that it changed brightness very significantly. And for a solid object, the best way to explain that is that maybe it's a rotating object and sometimes you're seeing a lot of it and sometimes you're not seeing a lot of it. So the best explanation is that it's in fact this very elongated uh, shape object. And so what is this thing? There was a lot of discussion. Is it an alien spaceship? Maybe, nobody knows what it was. So our guest tonight, Dave Jewett, came to All Space Considered to talk to us about this object uh, when there was only one and he made predictions that we will see more. Uh, David Reitzel had a very lively conversation with him about how do you extrapolate from an example of one. Uh, and so you'll see in this little clip for that, uh, that, that Dave decides, okay, he's had enough of this argument, it doesn't matter. And so here he is uh, uh, from two years ago. Point is, it doesn't matter what I think or you think, we'll know because we're gonna detect more of these things. So my prediction is you'll find another one within a year, something like that. Um, of this size, a small body like this. 
So we'll know. So we'll know. So sure enough, about two years later, another one, Borisov, another interstellar comet was detected. Again, it has this crazy orbit that kind of comes in, gets perturbed a little bit, and then flies back out of our solar system. And just uh, these, they didn't come in at the same time, but just to show you sort of their respective uh, orbits, you can see in this little little animated GIF, uh, you know, they, they both just came flying through our solar system and on they went. So uh, because we had a nice advanced warning of, um, of uh, <laughs> all those dings tell me there's a question, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, let me just finish here and say that uh, we had a chance to see some beautiful um, images from Hubble and oh, look who took that picture, Dave Jewett. Huh, wouldn't it be great if we could have Dave Jewett join us and tell us about it. Um, we found a lot of things about it. it. In many ways, it's quite a bit like our solar system. It has a lot of abundances like our solar system, but then it has it had a lot more carbon dioxide than, than a typical comet in our own solar system. So hmm, are interstellar comets different than our own comets from our solar system or are they the same? Well, just as they were looking up, uh, you know, observing it on its way out of the solar system, none other than look at the first author on that, Dave Jewett, discovered that it's breaking up and in fact showed us uh, an image and I think he's gonna show us more images in a little bit uh, that uh, in March, while we were all learning how to zoom, uh, Comet Borisov was breaking up and uh, you can see the sort of the way that the nucleus is sp splitting up. So I wanted to tell you about those two comets because they're very cool and Dave is gonna be here and we, who, I wanna take advantage and let you take advantage to ask him some questions. So, um, Brendan, what was the question that came in? Uh, our quick question uh, came from Tad, and the question was, could you explain why everything else in that video is in the same plane, but the comet is in a completely different plane? That is a fantastic question. Our solar system formed from a collapsing gas cloud, and as the gas cloud collapsed, the spin of it kind of spins it into a flat disk. In other words, Everything that's in the collapsing uh, cloud can easily collapse in this direction, but because of conservation of angular momentum, the same thing that makes a skater spin and stay spinning, it can't collapse in this direction. It's gotta keep that angular momentum. So it all collapses to a disk. And that's all the planets were formed out of that disk. And, uh, but comets were leftover debris, even that Oort cloud, that outermost cloud is left over from the original uh, proto uh, solar system cloud. So it comes from all directions. And these guys, these interstellar guys, I'm pointing that way because my computer with the PowerPoint's over there, uh, are coming from wherever, yeah, out in the greater galaxy. And they don't know anything about the uh, orbit of, our, of the planets in our solar system. So I think I'm gonna um, keep moving and uh, hope that answers your question and go on to the third comet of our, our intro. And that is Comet Atlas. And Tony, why don't you tell us about Comet Atlas? Sure. Well, this is a comet that was discovered at the end of 2019. In fact, it has something to do with its name. Uh, the C means comet, then 2019, that self-explanatory. Y is because months are divided into halves. So there's so many comets discovered that just letters don't do it. So you need to uh, divide each month into half. So January, for instance, includes A and B. But by the time you get to December, the last half of December is Y. And this was the fourth comet discovered in the last half of December, 2019. So to shorten that, you just say C 2019 Y4. And then the discoverer gets a credit. This was discovered by an automated system and, uh, and it's, its acronym is ATLAS. In fact, do you know the name of the system, Laura? It's the, oh, it has some kind of an apocalyptic name that's kind of funny, but. Yeah, it has something, automated telescope for like last chances to live. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it spells ATLAS <laughs> with that annotation, yeah. Anyway, okay. um, so now that by itself to amateur astronomers is not a huge deal you know, lots of comets are discovered. It's kind of rare that they become bright enough to see through telescopes, but this one brightened very quickly. So uh, 
people were beginning people who follow comets were getting kind of excited about this one because it started steadily brightening uh, from February through uh, March. And it actually got bright enough where it was pretty easy to see in binoculars from dark skies. So extrapolating forward, people thought, you know, this comet could become bright enough even to be visible in bright twilight. And another thing about it was that it matched a comet, it matched the orbit of a comet that was seen back in 1844. Now we knew it wasn't the same comet because these comets both have periods. In other words, their orbital period is close to 5,000 years. So we're not gonna see that one in 1844 for pretty close to 5,000 years. Same with this one. So it could be a piece of that one. And, uh, and it looked like, well, if that one was nice, maybe this one would be too. And uh, that was the case up until the beginning of April. Then, <laughs> Oh, yeah, we have a couple pictures. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, people were sorry, posting. I'm busy things. looking up uh, Atlas, which I wasn't actually that far off. It stands for um, Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System. Yes. Yeah. So it, 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 I would, they say it would provide a few weeks' notice of an imminent collision. Or something. <laughs> anyway, hope that doesn't happen. But in any case, uh, people on social media were posting all kinds of beautiful videos and photographs of, of the comet. You know, some taken from backyards and stuff. And um, that was getting a lot of us hopeful that, you know, a trip out, out of the city might yield some nice pictures, especially in May, as the comet got bright. So, um, but and we can go to the next picture here. Um, and it, actually, this is the path of the comet. And you can see that when it, when it can, comes closest to the sun, as it still will towards the end of May, uh, it comes well within Mercury's orbit. And because of where the Earth is, it kind of comes roughly between Earth and the Sun. That has some advantages if the comet has a lot of dust in it, the dust can forward scatter, and that can make it brighter than even, you know, what you would ex extrapolate just from the fact it's closer to the Sun. So uh, even I was getting pretty excited about this one, I have to admit. Um, and, uh, and this is just looking back along the orbit, which uh, takes it uh, hundreds of astronomical units out uh, from the sun. Yeah, I think it's over it's six million period. years for a, for a single orbit. It's over six million years. Well, I, I think actually, I think it's closer to five. Actually, now they have it down to 5,000. Oh, okay. Actually, David, Jared, I'm sure can provide yeah, us. Yeah, we'll ask the expert when he gets here. Quick, look it up, Dave. But 1844 comet is around 5,000 years. And I think this one was following the same path. But anyway, um, so this is what a you know bright comet looks like in the day. But alas, <laughs> and uh, I guess we'll hear what happened. And I guess I have one more picture, though. And uh, in some of the amateur pictures, uh, uh, like on the left are older pictures, and on the right, you can see that the images are beginning to fade. So uh, astronomers, or amateur astronomers mainly, who had been looking at the rate of its brightening suddenly noticed that it leveled off, which is not a good sign for a comet because of what can happen. So with all of that by way of introduction, then um, I think it's time. Let's uh, have a, have our expert join us. There he is, Dave, it worked, you're there. Nice to see you. Can you hear um, me now? We can hear you just fine. Well, that's good. So uh, so I hope you liked all the references to your previous work. Ah. <laughs> and um, so do tell us, uh, what in the world is happening? What can we expect out of Comet Atlas? Uh, what does it mean? Are we all going to die? Yeah, no, nobody knows what it means. That's, that's the whole thing. Um, so the fact that it brightened very quickly, uh, as uh, was just explained, is very interesting to a lot of people and very exciting because maybe it's going to be really, really bright when it comes to perihelion. But actually, we know that oftentimes when you see a comet that brightens very rapidly as it comes towards the sun, it's because it's falling apart. <laughs> so that is exactly the case with Atlas. It, I mean, it has fallen apart already. So its perihelion distance is quarter of an AU, so a quarter of the, a quarter of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And that's pretty close. So the hope was, you know, hey, if it's bright at two AUs from the Sun and it's bright at one and a half AUs, it must be really bright 
at a quarter of an AU, but that has now totally collapsed because it, it literally fell to bits. And to answer the question, I did look it up. It's the period is 6,000 years. <laughs> I didn't know that. I, yeah. So um, what, what's happening is it's gone from, you know, the, the, the next comet of the century, so to speak, and we have many, many comets every, <laughs> every century that get that label because people are always thinking, this is going to be the big one. It's going to be great. And then they fail um, to being very interesting because it broke up. And so it offers us um, the chance to find out something about the breakup uh, mechanism and, and just to look and see what's happening. And then maybe if we're lucky, we can figure out something about the, the nature of comets by looking at this kind of an event. So that's what, that's what I, I hope to get out of it. You know, it would have been nice to see it blazing across the sky, casting shadows and be able to smell the gas as it, as it, <laughs> as it passed the earth, but it's not gonna happen. Now, um, three weeks ago, I asked you to join us um, and uh, before it really fell apart and you said, oh, I've got Hubble data coming yeah. up the whole time. How is it that Hubble's able to just quickly go, um, you know, uh, and point at this telescope? Well, how, how did you get Hubble time in no time flat when this is happening? Well, you have to write a proposal in no time flat. So I wrote a proposal uh, and, and then the good people of Space Telescope were kind enough to, to allocate some uh, time, just two orbits to this thing. Um, HST is intrinsically not very fast. So you, you know, it's, a, it's a thing in space. They don't want to mess with it. They don't want to screw anything up. So they're very cautious with uploading new pointing positions. Everything is very, very carefully controlled by a whole team of experts. Um, and I think in the end, it was two weeks or two and a half weeks or something to get the the observation, which is fast for HST, but it's not like, you know, your telescope in, in, in the backyard, you just go and point at it. <laughs> uh, that's much, in a way, much better in terms of being able to get a quick look at something. So HST is this, is this very, very special instrument, but it's, it's not a very speedy instrument in terms of looking at a new thing. So anyway, I, I feel happy about that. Um, there's another team led by uh, Quan Ji Ye, from University of Maryland who also uh, had, had time to look at this comet. So together we had three orbits of space telescope to look at uh, Comet Atlas. And maybe- Rich, you should shall we see it? I think you have some pictures, yes? I'm gonna try to make them visible with this Zoom share screen thing. So hold on. And while you're holding on, any, can you guys hear the screaming and banging up? I don't have the door open, but no. oh, okay. Not yet. Quite loud here. <laughs> no. Can you see that or not? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, we had basically um, observations with Hubble on two days, the 20th of April and the 23rd of April. <clears throat> so the top and the bottom pictures. And you can see what we'd already seen from the ground, but a much higher resolution. So from the ground, uh, in pictures that you can find on the web, these, um, these little subnuclei are kind of blended, for the most part, blended together. And then the very faint ones, which even on this picture, I must say, are hard to, hard to see on my computer screen, uh, are just not visible at all from the ground. So in that top picture from the 20th of April, I counted um, over 30 individual fragments of uh, what used to be Comet Atlas. Now, now it's Comet Atlases, I guess. Uh, and maybe um, on the 23rd, there, there are a couple dozen that I could, could see without trying too hard. So we know that the comet has fragmented. And we also see that what we've seen before, that the, the fragments are embedded in this kind of diffuse halo of dust. Uh, and what that consists of is all the particles that are, are there contributing to the scattered light, they're just reflecting sunlight back to us, uh, but they're individually too small to see as points. But there's like thousands and millions of them. So we see this big dust sheet that was ejected from the original body when it broke up. And then we see that each of the little subunits looks like a mini comet. It's got its own little tail pointing up there to about you know the 930 position. Um, just like an independent comet, which it is. So in a sense, it's a picture of, in the top, a picture of 30 comets that have a common recent origin, but now they're 30 independent things going around the sun. 
and they're moving apart. Um, speed is, is, is on the order of you know, a meter per second, very, very small. So walking speed or a little slower than walking speed, they're separating, uh, but very, very gentle. It's not like a powerful energetic explosion, dynamite explosion. It's a, it's a very gentle separation of these uh, pieces, which is probably a clue to the mechanism behind the breakup of this thing. So that's roughly what we see. Um, I mean, a, a good question uh, that could be asked is how, how big was this thing before it broke up? And the sad answer is we don't really know, but a guess would be a few hundred meters, something like that. So it's almost certainly not a very big object, probably not bigger than a kilometer, I'm guessing 300 meters, something like that. Um, and, and now it's divided up into a whole bunch of smaller pieces which are themselves continuing to disintegrate. So I guess the last thing, I don't wanna to talk too much about that, but the last thing I would say is if you compare the top picture and the bottom one, it actually turns out to be quite difficult to know, you know, wh which piece is which. It's quite difficult to connect the dots between those, those two pictures. Um, and frankly, I, I have not myself succeeded in connecting many of the dots uh, in this. So I think that means that the individual pieces are turning on and turning off. And so if you could do a movie, that'd be really nice, but if you could take a movie of this thing, it would look like lights flashing on a Christmas tree, all separating at the same time as this thing um, is, is swinging around the sun. So it's still a while. So. NASA did string together some of these ish, uh, images. And well, no, they, they, they did a kind of a cute thing. thing. They, they blended those two pictures, that's all. There's, there's, no, there's no more information than those two pictures. Oh, so those are the only two? It looked like more, but it made it look like it was quite the flashy. Oh, no, they're good at that. It's like JPL is good at doing things like that too, but they, they just blended the two pictures to simulate something that looks half believable. But actually it's, it's only those two pictures that we have. Um, yeah. So per perihelion is um, on May the 31st, again, at a quarter of an AU. Um, it will then be pretty close to the sun. So space telescope can no longer look at it because it's already too close to the sun in the sky. So basically it's all over as far as these high resolution pictures are concerned. Um, amateur astronomers and, and brave astronomers with, with big telescopes uh, if they were not shut down by coronavirus, could also look uh, at it. Uh, but my guess is we, we've seen the last of it for the most part. My guess is that we won't see it after perihelion, uh, both because it'll be too faint, it'll be fragmented into tiny pieces, and also because we won't know where it is, because our ability to predict the position that far in the future, it doesn't come out of the sun for space telescope until September. Um, we, we just won't know where to point. So I think that's it for HST on Comet Atlas. Yeah, well, uh, sorry we won't get the nice show, but at least uh, we can not have a lot of uh, doomsday yeah. crazy talk on, on uh, you know, on what the comet means. And although I'm going to just say, Dave, I'm going to out you here. <laughs> I believe you did say to me that you thought the comet brought the... Uh, you know, like like the Andromeda strain, it, it brought this coronavirus. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's this comet or Borisov. One of those two brought <laughs> almost certainly one of those two brought the virus to the Earth, and we're suffering the consequence right now. There's some good science fiction in that. If you good, have good luck to all those conspiracy theorists yeah. out there. So, would you like me to talk just very briefly about the the meaning of breakup or not? Uh, you know, actually, before we do that, can oh. we um, take uh, Brendan? Yeah. You have questions that we've had several questions come in. Any that are pertain to the things that um, Dave has been talking about? We do. Yes. Um, one of the questions uh, is from Alex, uh, and he asks, uh, let me make sure I have it up. Uh, why doesn't the comet get caught in the sun's gravitational pull and remain in orbit around it? So probably specifically referring to, uh, to trans solar system uh, comets. So that, like Borisov or Oumuamua. Yes. So the, the answer is a good question. The answer is they're just going too fast. So there's a maximum speed over which the sun can exert control on an object. It's, it's called the escape speed, the gravitational escape speed. And actually that's how we know that these bodies are not from the solar system. 
they're just traveling faster than the gravitational escape speed from the sun. So s simply the sun doesn't have enough mass and enough gravity to, to hold them back. Great. So yeah, go ahead and share with the others about the breakup, your other slides there. So I just very, very put, quickly put this together, uh, just something to talk about. Um, I mean, the first question really is who cares, right? <laughs> I mean, astronomers care. Um, um, they're, they're nice, they're pretty to look at. Smashed up comets are kind of cool, but scientifically, who cares? Well, it matters actually, because we don't know um, how comets are ultimately destroyed. So you mentioned earlier on, we know where they come from. They come from the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud, and they fall into the vicinity, vicinity of the planets. Um, but, but we know that they don't seem to last when they're in the vicinity of the planets. So if they, if they were just point sources like asteroids, they were not losing material, they would be able to survive for half a million years on the average. So 500,000 years, a pretty long time. But when we look at the comets, we don't see enough comets um, in the vicinity of the planets to, to have lived for that long. So if we, in other words, if we collected comets for half a million years, we would have a lot more than the number we see. So we think that they live for maybe 10,000 or 20,000 years once they're in the inner solar system. And in the old days, which means like 10 years ago, people thought, well, that's because they come in, they're, they're covered in ice, and then that ice is all boiled away. It's all vaporized. And then after that, there's, nothing, there's no icy thing. So it doesn't look like a comet. It just looks like an asteroid. But we actually don't see a large number of dead comets either. People are working all the time to find dead comets, um, but we don't find that many. And so the suspicion is that this breakup process might actually be the dominant way in which the comets uh, die. So this might be the number one destructive process um, that's removing comets from the inner solar system. And if that's the case, we'd like to know how does that work? So people have different ideas. One idea is tidal. If a comet comes near to a planet or the sun, the gravity of the planet or the gravity of the sun could rip it to shreds. So there's this tidal disruption hypothesis. We know that that's totally irrelevant for Comet Atlas because it hasn't been near the sun yet and it hasn't been near a planet. It came in at 45 degrees to the solar system. So we can forget that one. Um, people always say, well, maybe it hit something and maybe it did, but that's very, very unlikely because space is just so incredibly empty. The probability that a comet is gonna hit something big enough to break it up is, is really kind of tiny. So it's very unlikely to be due to an impact. And in addition, when you look at those fragments, the fragments themselves are also breaking up and presumably they're not being hit you know, independently by other bodies as they come through. So the first two explanations, probably not that good. Maybe there's some kind of an explosion, like maybe there's like super volatile ice. You mentioned carbon monoxide. Maybe there's a lot of carbon monoxide that gets heated by the sun and makes a pocket of high pressure gas and the thing blows up like a hand grenade. But that seems doubtful to me as well because to make a hand grenade, you need a strong steel shell, right? You explode the um, material inside the shell and then uh, the pressure builds up until the uh, hand grenade uh, frag fragments and creates shrapnel. But a comet is not strong like that. We know that comets are made of very, very weak uh, material, almost like talcum powder. So it's hard to imagine how you could build up a bomb out of talcum powder. And so the last one is my favorite. Um, which is rotational instability. And that is the comet um, spins itself up faster and faster and faster until it just blows itself apart. It's, it's centri centrifugal acceleration becomes bigger than gravity and it literally spins itself apart. So, you know, I can't say which one is correct. Maybe there are other ideas too, um, but my, my bet would be on the last one. So I just have a couple of pictures. I'll, I'll zip through, the, through those. Here's, um, Here's one that we know was a tidal disruption. That's the famous Shoemaker-Levy 9 that was pulled apart by Jupiter um, back in like 1993, something like that. Here's a comet that um, I did get to observe with HST in 2016, um, the, the very not famous 332P Ikea 
Murakami. <laughs> um, and I hope you can see the movie. Do you see it moving? Um, no? Yes. Oh, you do? OK. Yep. So I, these are images from three nights, 26, 27, 28 January. I registered them on the bright thing, which is the parent of all the other things. And you can see all the other objects are moving away from it at a speed that actually increases with the distance. It's a bit like Hubble's law. Uh, and so this is a cloud of fragments released from this body and moving off at this speed, which is like uh, less than a meter per second. So I think that Atlas, if we had more, more nights or more orbits of data, would show this kind of motion. Um, and there's a close up, just I, these are the pieces that I was able to measure in that comment. So there's a lot of stuff. There's like a lot of bits to look at. Um, here's one from a while ago, again, with uh, Space Telescope. This is uh, 1999 S4. This is a long period Oort cloud comet that uh, fragmented and made this big uh, cloud of dust pushed back by radiation pressure from the sun. Um, here's a very, very pretty picture of uh, the, the even more annoyingly named 73P Swashman Washman. <laughs> uh, wow, I'm, I'm pleased I could say that. Uh, you can see all the pieces there. And the, these, these literally are, you know, tiny fragments. They're probably five meters across and 10 meters across. So, you know, like the size of, um, size of your house or smaller, um, all resulting from that, uh, that body at the head. Here's um, a picture of, of what can happen in an extreme circumstance. So this is a picture by uh, a very good amateur astronomer, Ernesto Guido and his colleagues, uh, who actually puts really nice pictures on the web of many interesting comets. Uh, and you can see he's taken two, two pictures here showing basically this fuzzy thing, like where's the nucleus in that, in that picture? There's no bright point. There's just a bunch of stars and things in the background, but the comet now is just a, just a cloud of, of debris. The whole thing is basically disintegrated into pieces that are individually too small to be seen. And we don't honestly know how that happens, but it does happen sometimes. Um, and then just because it's always good to look at freaks, uh, <laughs> here, here is an asteroid. This is not a comet, it's an asteroid called 2013 R3. Its orbit is right there in the asteroid belt. If I showed you the orbit, you would never pick this out from any other asteroid. You could not because its orbit is the orbit of an asteroid. But what does it look like? Well, it looks like a fragmented comet. So this, whatever this process is that can fragment um, a comet nucleus, it can do it also to asteroids. So I thought this is a, a very excellent object. Um, so uh, before you move to your last picture there, may I ask, speaking of asteroids, would you, do you think um, Oumuamua is an asteroid or, uh, you yeah. know, maybe I'll just, and I'm going to uh, put you on spot on this question because it's a tough one. One of the things that was kind of, um, fascinating for people was that Oumuamua changed its orbit as it swung through. Right. So there was some acceleration of some sort, which made some people say, oh, well, they turned on their warp engines or their, their right. thrusters, and it's, a, it's clearly a spaceship. Yep. So what caused, I mean, is it a comet? Did it outgas? Well, was, how did it? I mean, it's either an asteroid or a comet or a spaceship. So, you know, the, the really cool one, of course, is the, space, the spaceship. I would love it to be a spaceship, <laughs> but um, you know, we, we would need much more evidence to argue that it's um, uh, a spaceship. Can so, you explain the acceleration through natural causes? Yeah, maybe. So the the it's called not they call it non gravitational acceleration. So it's it's change it's changing its position. It's accelerating a little bit differently from what is caused by the sun alone, and that's a general feature of comets. And it's caused by what's called the rocket effect. So the stuff that comes off the comet nucleus mostly leaves the day side because the day side is the hot side. That's where the ice is vaporized and it goes whoosh off towards the sun. And so that uh, by Newton's law uh, exerts a push in the opposite direction, like a rocket, like the gas coming out of the nozzle of a rocket. So that rocket effect could explain uh, Oumuamua. The trouble is we don't see any stuff coming out of that object. 
I mean, people, I look very hard, other people look very, very hard. We don't see any material coming out. So that's weird. It so is. it's possible that the only thing that came out was gas. And the kinds of pictures that I've been showing you are not sensitive to gas. They, they are most sensitive to dust. So uh, it's possible that for some reason, Oumuamua emitted pure gas. But why would it be like that? That's kind of a weird, you know, made up explanation. It's possible, but that's possible. That that's, seems unlikely. And there was another a- idea, another branch of idea that's, that's been talked about by several groups now is that actually the, um, the structure of Oumuamua is more like a sheet of mylar. You know, this, um, when, when people have those birthday balloons, you know, happy birthday and uh, uh, have a lovely birthday, that kind of, the, the, the aluminized mylar is um, very thin material and very reflective. If you had a piece of mylar uh, in sunlight, it would feel a pressure from the sunlight and that would give it a non-gravitational acceleration. So people began to talk about Oumuamua as being a very, very thin, uh, low density object. Maybe it's not a sheet of mylar, that would have to be alien mylar, <laughs> but um, maybe it's a very low density kind of honeycomb, fractal, porous nucleus. And there are a bunch of papers saying that, hey, we think we can explain everything if the nucleus has a density of maybe um, a thousand times less than the density of water. In other words, that's the density of air. So that would have to be a remarkable thing in itself to be such a low, low density and to have survived in interstellar space, maybe for hundreds, millions or billions of years, that would be a strange thing. So there's several possible explanations for the non-grav on Oumuamua, but there's no clear answer for that. So it remains a mystery, it's very interesting. There was a paper not too long ago of a group that included Doug Lynn that said that you could model it and understand the shape and and even some of these characteristics of Oumuamua if it was a planet that had gotten too close to a star and ripped it apart into shards and you got these long sort of yeah. tensile strength in one direction and not the other um, shards of a planet. Do you think that's a good explanation or you think no, that's no, wrong? no. Uh, no, no, because it doesn't account for the non-gravitational acceleration at all. I mean, it may it may be a shard of something, um, but the non-grav is is totally left out of that picture. They they say a few words about that, but it's not part of their model. It's not um, something that their model really fits. So actually, for a long time, I, I assumed that the non-gravitational acceleration was was wrong. <laughs> So, you know, in, in science, the idea is basically you assume everything is wrong. You don't believe stuff, you, you believe it must be wrong somehow until you can't escape that belief. So I thought, I thought they must have messed up with the um, determination of non-gravitational acceleration. But, you know, the people who did that work are experts and the effect is a big effect. It's not a small, subtle thing, it's a big effect. So I don't think they screwed up anymore. I think it's a real but unexplained non-gravitational acceleration. So I have no real answer about that. It's just a big mystery. On the other hand, Borisov also has non-gravitational acceleration, but it's no mystery because we see all the stuff coming out of Borisov. So that that's yeah. just like, like any other comet. I think that's your last picture. So tell us about it and then we'll take a couple questions. Go ahead. Well, so um, in early March, I think March, between March six and nine, something like that, um, a Polish group led by uh, Mike Drahus, who used to be my postdoc at UCLA, uh, noticed that the object was brightening. So it brightened by 0.7 of a magnitude, which is like a factor of two or something. And as I mentioned earlier, often when a comet brightens unexpectedly like that, it means maybe it broke up. So, so people were like, well, maybe something good's gonna happen. It's gonna, it's gonna fall, in, fall apart in front of our eyes. But there was no further development now, I, I have had this program with my colleagues to image uh, Borisov with the Space Telescope. So we get the highest resolution you can possibly get. Um, and we did see a, a double nucleus, actually, in um, March the 30th, so one, about one month ago, suggesting that the nucleus indeed had split. So this Drahus brightening thing, yeah, maybe the nucleus split. So here's a picture that summarizes that. <clears throat> there are different dates. I didn't have time to put the dates on 
the, the pictures, but they start in January and they go to April. And what you notice maybe is the one in the middle looks like a peanut. The other ones are all round, but we've got this cosmic peanut thing in the middle the picture. So it looks like the nucleus is split in two. And again, I assumed something was wrong. The space telescope pointing was bad or went out of focus or something, I don't know. Um, but no, it's a good image. Uh, and it really had that appearance on that day, but not um, four days later uh, and not seven days before. Those are the adjacent pictures. So it's a short lived uh, phenomenon in Borisov that made it look like a double object for a little while. And the tendency when you see a picture like that is to think, well, the nucleus must have broken in two. And the whole language of split comets gives you this feeling that oh yeah, split comet, it broke into two pieces or fragmented comet, it broke into three big pieces or something. But actually, um, there's no close correlation between how bright a piece is and how massive is the thing causing that brightness because we're only looking at dust. So what it means is there's comparable amounts of dust in those two things, those two ends of the peanut. Um, but one of them has the real nucleus in it and the other one has a tiny object and it's probably a few meters or something like that across. So it's a piece came off the nucleus. Um, and then that piece only survived for a few days because in the next picture to the right, it's gone. <coughs> so I wouldn't call it a, a breakup. I mean, the nucleus ejected a thing. Um, a photon the, torpedo still... maybe or... What's that? A photon torpedo perhaps or a shell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. But I'm, 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 alien, so I'm, I'm on record yeah. with that at this time. But it, no. <laughs> so, so again, you know, we don't know why it did that, but that rotational hypothesis is a nice one because we know the Borisov is small. It's only it's less than 500 meters in radius, probably 400 meters in radius, and we know that small comets like that can change their spin when they're losing mass quite quickly. And so it's entirely plausible that the Borisov nucleus is rotating quickly and a boulder dropped off the surface yeah. because of that. So that could be a very mundane explanation of what we see in that peanut picture. Great. And while we go over to questions, I know we have two. I've got to ask, is anybody else thinking no more rhymes than I mean it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I'm glad you got the reference. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have a couple of comments and one question, if I may. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, the people who observe comets carefully, even in the amateur world, are rather small in numbers. And uh, I, I covered comets a lot for our Griffith Observer magazine. And I remember you, your colleague, uh, Quan Ji, uh, when he was in high school, because he had a blog in Shanghai of his comet observations. And he was one of the few places on the internet where you could find comet information from amateurs. And um, also, I remember you because uh, I, w I also covered the hunt for Halley's Comet starting in 1980, and you were mm -hmm. on the team at Palomar that made the first image of Halley's Comet in 1982. Back when, say, ragtimes were popular, I mean, back uh, it, it, the first time it was seen since ragtimes were pop popular early in the uh, in the 20th century. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> A lot's changed musically, but yeah, those were pretty popular tunes in their day. Um, thanks for that, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brendan. Oh, David. I have a question. Um, have you revised the estimate of the number of interstellar objects in the solar system? Last time you told it was 10,000. Now we've seen two. What's our new number? It's about the same. About so the same? That's cool. Because we, we love telling this to our visitors because it's kind of mind-blowing to think there's that many of them. So that's I thought that excellent. was the most, to me, that was the most interesting thing, actually. Yeah. The, the population has got to be huge because we're so bad at detecting these small, fast objects going by the Earth. You know, there has to be a huge number for us to have a chance of seeing even the first one. That was the, the essence of that argument. Mm -hmm. And let me be the first to say I was also lucky, <laughs> lucky to get the right answer. <laughs> but um, other people have done that calculation in more detail. I just did it on a piece of paper and they did it in detail and they get the same answer. Uh, and it's, it's fully confirmed by Borisov. But, you know, we'll learn more as we find more objects. So when we get um, 
certainly when we get the LSST, which is this big um, survey telescope that's going to be doing the whole sky every couple of nights, that should find a lot of these things. But Borisov was not a big survey telescope guy. He had his own backyard telescope, basically. And so there's a real chance that now, now our eyes and our minds are open to this kind of object. There's a real chance that we can uh, find more uh, just by people going out into the back and having a look. So Brendan, we have a couple of questions from our audience and then we'll move on. We do, we do, and I'll try to get through them quickly. Um, so Lisa on live stream asks, uh, what causes the ice in comet nuclei to form? So stepping back a little ways in the conversation. Yeah, so that, that's a good one too. It goes right back to the origin of this, the planetary systems. So, you know, the Borisov and Oumuamua are from a different planetary system, but the idea is probably the same. So um, as Laura mentioned, the solar system starts out as kind of a disk. And there's a particular distance in that disk called the snow line, um, inside which water can only exist as steam, essentially, and outside which it can only exist as ice. So all the objects that formed inside that snow line uh, tend to be rocky uh, because there's no ice for them to trap. It's only steam, it's a gas, and it's harder to trap. Whereas objects outside that snow line are cold because they're further away from the central star. And that's where the ice is. And so when you build a body, you've got ice and rock and dust and stuff mixed together. So the objects are intrinsically icy if they form beyond the snow line. It's like when you go up a mountain, if you go up like you wait the winter time in Southern California, for example, and you look over to the mountains, if, <laughs> if the smog allows you to see the mountains, you can see there's a snow line. There's a definite line above which there's snow and below which there isn't. And that's because the temperature is dropping as you go up the mountain and you reach a point where suddenly the water just has to be frozen because it's so cold. Well, it's like that when you go away from the sun. You reach a point where the water just has to be frozen because it's so cold. And in our solar system, that distance is something like three, three and a half times the Earth-Sun distance. So I think what it means is the comets formed f uh, further away from the sun than that. And that's not a big surprise because Kuiper Belt is 40, 40 times the Earth-Sun distance and the comets in the Oort cloud uh, formed somewhere between Jupiter and Neptune, so somewhere between five times the Earth-Sun distance and, and 30 times the Earth-Sun distance. So they've just, they just formed far away and so they automatically incorporate ice. Great. And was there another one, Brendan? There we... were uh, there were two more. Uh, so Lisa also asked, uh, could asteroids be formed by comets breaking apart? So something like uh, Comet Atlas, when it breaks apart, could we see those turn into asteroids? Well, I think so, in principle. So that, that comes back to the idea of you know, where do the comets go? <clears throat> so if a comet dies simply by losing its ice, if it just gets warmed by the sun and the ice just, just goes away, then the thing you've got left behind is rocky. And then to all the, essentially to all of the observational techniques that we have, um, it would look like an asteroid. So we'd say, yeah, it's an asteroid. It might be moving in a comet-like orbit, uh, but it would have an asteroidal appearance. So the basic answer is yes. And there are some objects indeed in the solar system that move with the orbits of comets. So these very elliptical, you know, long, skinny, sometimes highly inclined orbits, uh, but don't show any activity at all. And so those are candidates for being essentially dead comets. So yeah, that can happen. Great. And is and the last one a quick one, Brendan? Our final question, uh, it could be, uh, hopefully it will be. Um, so uh, with Atlas being kind of a dud, when can we expect uh, to see the next visible comet? Perhaps the, the kind of the wrap up of the Atlas comet discussion. Who, who said Atlas is a dud? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that was me. That is me uh, putting my own spin idea. on it for flavor. <laughs> uh, so the question was what when's the next one when uh, yes when's the next like visible one for for those spectators on earth i have no idea i honestly don't know does anybody else know news, news for you later in the show okay cool Ooh, there's a tease well, Dave, we are extremely grateful uh, that you chose to spend your Friday evening with us. I know we all have uh, places to go, people to see. So we're so happy that you uh, spent that time with us. Okay. And, uh, 
you know, you're welcome to stay, uh, but I know you probably got to get back to your next proposal and, you know, chime in anytime you like. We're, we're always happy to have you join us. Okay. It's always a pleasure to see you. Well, thanks for asking me. All right. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, right. He has to unshare his screen. I guess he'll figure that part out. There it goes. Um, okay, well, with that, um, Tony, you said there was a surprise, so maybe we should just get to it and uh, tell us about the Sky Report. It's part of, actually, Patrick's doing the Sky Report tonight. So go ahead, Patrick, tell us about okay. uh, what's in the sky. Okay, so um, we'll start with this uh, picture, which I took uh, last month. And uh, one of the prominent uh, planets uh, still visible right after sunset is Venus. And we can go to the next slide and we can identify all the objects in this picture. Uh, there we go. So there's Venus and uh, Venus is still with us, uh, but not for long because it's uh, at the beginning of this month, it'll be setting one and a half hours after sunset. And then by next week, it will only be uh, uh, one hour. This is a picture that Tony took uh, showing Venus's uh, phase uh, through a telescope. And it's a, a little uh, waning uh, crescent phase now. Uh, we can go to the next slide because uh, something's gonna be happening with Venus in the evening sky. On the 21st, uh, look to the uh, uh, west and uh, southwest, look for Venus. And right next to it, next slide is the planet Mercury, and its only uh, separation between the two are just about one degree apart. Uh, you probably need a pair of binoculars to see a Mercury, which is substantially fainter than uh, Venus. And uh, this view is just about one hour before Venus and Mercury sets uh, below the horizon. Okay, well, let's go to the next slide here. In the evening sky, um, we're going to just do a quick uh, review of the stars that you can see in the spring sky. Look to the south uh, at any night, around about nine, and uh, you'll see uh, a, a two bright stars. One of them is Arcturus, which is known as the bear guardian, guardian of the, of the Big Dipper or the Great Bear, and the other is uh, Procyon. Between the two stars, uh, there are, uh, there's a constellation called Leo the Lion, which you've all heard of. You can go to the next slide, and it's bright star Regulus. You can see the shape there. There's a backwards question mark for the head and mane of the lion. And uh, the hindquarters is just made of a triangle. Just a little bit lower uh, of, of is Virgo and its bright star um, Spica. Uh, Virgo, it looks like a y letter Y shaped letter in the sky. And uh, if for a little bit more of a challenge, if you're learning constellations for the first time, uh, look a little bit lower below Virgo and you'll see the constellation Corvus, which is made out of four stars. It looks like a trapezoid. All right, we'll turn to the morning sky. Oh, oh of course, if you have active imaginations, you can see these, uh, these constellations. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll turn to the morning sky. And uh, last month, uh, we saw a spectacular arrangement of uh, three bright planets that you can see early morning, and uh, this picture I took uh, showing the moon uh, below Mars, Saturn, and, and Jupiter. You can see this again um, in, uh, it, we'll take a look in the next slide here, starting May 11, where the, uh, the, the moon is uh, to the right of Jupiter and Saturn and Mars. But if you get up uh, every morning around about 4.30, you can see the moon move uh, below, uh, next slide, on the, uh, below Jupiter on the 12th. And we can continue, and you can see the sequence of events between Mars and uh, Saturn, and the moon slowly moves and becomes more crescent shaped as it passes Mars in the, in the morning sky. Um, okay, and now for that uh, surprise, uh, well, next slide, and this is a beautiful comet, uh, Comet Swan, uh, which was uh, became visible right after uh, uh, Atlas broke up and uh, it, you need a telescope to see this, but there was an opportunity to see it, a very, very limited opportunity. And we're gonna play you a little animation here and show you that if you were to get up in the early morning of, uh, of May, starting on the 14th, you can see that the comet will be visible in the north uh, northeast, but for a very limited time. 
The comet uh, will be maximum, it's, I think it's gonna be about third magnitude. So you do need to see, uh, use a pair of binoculars to see it. And you might only see the tail because it's just high enough. You might not be able to see the head or the nucleus of the comet. So uh, that's a limited opportunity, but you need a very clear view of the horizon and a very, and it has to be kind of clear uh, of haze. If I can add, Patrick, right now it's only visible from the Southern hemisphere. But okay. it's late this month that it moves to the Northern hemisphere, but unfortunately that's it. And then it disappears for several weeks until it reappears much, much fainter in June. So, uh, so that's it, but it's better than Atlas will probably be in terms of brightness. Right. <laughs> okay, and lastly, what are our moon phases next month? We're gonna go with the, uh, with the state flower of California, which is the uh, golden poppy here. And um, full moon's on the 7th, uh, last quarter is on the 15th. And if we don't like a sky with no moon, that's gonna be the 21st. And uh, first quarter is the 29th, if you wanna see the moon right after sunset. And that's it for the Sky Report. Thank you so much, Patrick. David, you have been unbelievably patient over there. <laughs> so I think we want to hear uh, from you now. You have some very interesting stories to tell us. Um, so, Thanks. yeah. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, well, this is kind of an exciting story. This is our world's largest telescope, at least in terms of being a single dish, a single mirror, really, is what we're looking at. This is the FAST radio telescope in China. And if we step forward, we can see how incredibly large this really is. It is 5.47 American football fields, not including the end zones. That doesn't have the end zones in there. Um, so it's 500 meters across, which is pretty incredible. Um, it reminds me a lot of Arecibo, although this is brand new, has some newer technologies and it gives it a lot more capability. It's a really fantastic telescope and it works in the radio. It is a radio telescope. We step forward here. It actually was making some observations of this globular cluster, M92, and it was looking for some very interesting types of stars, a star called a pulsar. And if we go forward a slide here, see how they form. Um, stars form out of these nebulae and average star will turn into a red giant, turn into planetary nebula and a white dwarf. Well, that's not what it was looking for. It's looking for the remnant of a massive star that turns into a red supergiant, a lot like Betelgeuse, goes supernova, explodes. Well, if it's massive enough, it can leap beyond a black hole or a neutron star. And if the neutron star is spinning fast enough, it can be a pulsar, strong magnetic fields. You get beams of radiation coming out each side. In fact, let's go forward a slide. I think we have some examples of it. It makes a very, very small core. It's city sized. You know, you're looking at something that's 12 ish kilometers across. So, you know, that's New York City. How big is it compared to LA? You know, what is it? Uh, one, one, more, one slide forward for me here compared to LA. 12 and a half miles across is the size of that one in that example. Um, so, yeah, these are very, very small objects, yet they have the mass more than one and a half solar masses roughly. So take one and a half suns, squeeze it down into that size and you have a neutron star. So incredible objects, incredibly strong gravity, yet if you have strong magnetic fields, they also spin like lighthouses. Pretty cool objects. Well, this fast radio telescope found a millisecond pulsar. We step forward a slide here and take a look at what that might look like. Those beams of radiation coming out either side, it spins quickly but the spin axis is not aligned with those radiations. So picture the spin axis going straight up and down on this image. And as it spins, those it'll carve out sort of cones of radiation. And if you're aligned in one of those directions, you can actually see it flash. Now these also can give off radio waves. You can pick them up in the radio, which is what the fast radio telescope did. Um, let's step forward here. Um, this is actually an image of a pulsar down in there and you can see sort of that disk of material around it, material around that neutron star that was left behind, and then beams that are coming out either side. So a very cool image that was taken there by, by Chandra. If we step forward again, that just proves they're real. Here's the image of the fast radio telescope. On the left-hand side are the data it took, and that's over time passing by. So it's time is sweeping vertically. And then phase is showing it's picking up a couple of pulses there. Um, yet there's dark regions in there. Something strange is going on. This is an eclipsing uh, millisecond pulsar. So there's another object 
blocking the light sometimes from us. In fact, it has a double eclipse. It blocks out the light sometimes, and then there's a broader eclipse that was a little strange and hard to interpret. By the way, we, if we step forward one, we can make the Green Bank Telescope the size it really is compared to FAST. And that's the reason the data on the right are so much uglier, that there's a, it, they're much noisier, it's hard to see those streaks. So our little Green Bank Telescope that's only about 100 meters across for that dish, um, has a much harder time picking up these objects, which goes to show the power of this fast radio telescope in, in China. So if we step forward here, we can see what's going on with this system. So the pulsar is rotating. Those beams of radiation are actually hitting a red dwarf star, vaporizing that star, and material is coming off of it, leaving a trail of debris. And sometimes that debris gets in our way, and sometimes the star gets in our way. There's two eclipses. Very, very neat system. Um, We've seen these before, though. This is the first one we've seen in M92, I believe. There are other there are other pulsars in M92, but this one's really cool. We can step forward to the still, and I'll finish up the story. Um, there's two different kinds of these. One, they can be called the Black Widow pulsar. If you don't see the red dwarf, if the red dwarf is too small to add much glow, you know it's being destroyed, and you see the evidence from the the cloud of debris. But if that red dwarf is massive enough, about a little bigger than 10% the mass of the sun, about 12% the mass of the sun is where they put the border, then they're called redbacks, which is interesting because it's really a spectral term. If you divide, take the spectra of these, you notice there's extra red light going across the spectrum, and it's because of the red dwarf. So if it's massive enough, it's bright enough, then this system that they discovered is actually a redback. So that M dwarf is massive enough adding some red light, and it's also dumping material down on that millisecond pulsar, spinning it up, causing it to spin so quickly. So super fun system that was found by the FAST radio telescope, our most powerful single dish radio telescope on Earth. Yeah. Oh, you're muted, Laura. Oh, I did it. I get a prize. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, David. Um, yeah, I've noticed you finished by saying it's the largest single dish radio telescope on Earth. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that is true. That is a fact. But it may not be always the largest single dish radio telescope in the solar system. There might be a bigger one. So, Patrick, do you want to tell us okay. about that? What, what makes us believe that might happen someday? Okay, uh, we'll start with the next slide uh, because uh, people have been dreaming about putting uh, large radio telescopes um, in the craters of the of the far side of the moon. Here's an artist concept, uh, actually from a, a NASA proposal of, of what it might be in 1989. And it's just too expensive. And so no one had any kind of ideas of how to make this cost effective until we fast forward to 2020, and we can go to the next slide, where uh, NASA has just accepted a proposal to uh, fund uh, research to um, actually build a telescope, radio telescope on the far side of the moon, which will be one kilometer across, which is twice the diameter of the fast uh, radio telescope. And uh, what's the reason for doing this? Well, if you look at the diagram at the bottom there, you can see that uh, when the Earth is between uh, the uh, moon and the sun, and, uh, and you put the radio telescope there, the moon basically shields uh, all the radio interference uh, coming from the Earth, and you get uh, uh, strong signals. Actually, detect, you can de detect strong signals, uh, or rather faint signals, from uh, deep within uh, the uh, distant universe. So that's a driving point for it. How is this, Glibby? Oh, I love Lucy on the far side of the moon. Yeah, well, you know what? They might be able to pick up that too. <laughs> It'd be really uh, red shifted. Uh, so if we look at the next slide, uh, the proposal shows you how this would be done. You can see uh, at the top there, uh, uh, two uh, kind of spacecrafts comes in. One lands in the middle of the crater that's selected. And then there are these uh, robotic rovers uh, that land on the edge of the crater. The one in the middle has the, uh, has the, uh, uh, basically the mesh for the radio telescope. And uh, basically these uh, uh, dual axle rovers uh, crawl down into the crater, uh, basically uh, unravels the, the, uh, uh, the, the net, uh, just like a fish net out, and then uh, it's suspended in the crater and then becomes uh, operational. This is actually uh, one of the many proposals that was accepted by uh, NASA's 
um, Innovative Advanced Concepts, which is a small pro program uh, within NASA. And uh, it's selected for phase one for an initial study of whether this is feasible or not. Uh, there are actually 16 phase one projects uh, that have been selected this year and six uh, phase two and one phase three. So whether it's feasible or not, um, if this is the beginning of this study. And uh, if it is, maybe 10 or 15 years, we might see a large radio telescope on the moon. That would be fabulous. Um, so I noticed the other piece of uh, David's comment was it's the largest single dish telescope on Earth. But David, uh, I think your next story is about a telescope that's, well, as big as the Earth. Oh, David, you're muted. <laughs> I did it. I did it twice. Uh, Still. Triple clicking it here. I'll just hold my finger there. Um, yeah, that's one of the reasons I said it. This the size of the Earth part. Indeed, there's a telescope that we call the Event Horizon Telescope. It was created to be able to well image the event horizon of a black hole. And if we go forward one, we can see that image. This is the image they released. That's the shadow of the black hole in the middle. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but to get this image, it's the equivalent of looking at a grapefruit on the moon, which is pretty crazy, being able to see a single grapefruit on the moon with this telescope. So the resolution is nuts. Now, what else can you do with it? Well, they went back and looked at some of their calibrating sources, and they found something interesting. They found a jet coming from a quasar. So jets, what are they? Well, here's a galaxy, not quite a normal looking galaxy. You can see this weird dust lane. It's an elliptical. Clearly it's undergone some sort of merger in the past. We step forward, we can see some radio data added in. And those lobes coming out of there are signs that there is a jet shooting from the black hole in the center. That material interacts with the intergalactic um, gas out there, the gas and dust, and it billows. And you can see it billowing at the end there. So something very powerful down in the center there is shooting that out because it's going out thousands and thousands of light years. It's really crazy. So stepping forward, we can take a look at what we think might be going on deep down inside of there. There's a black hole in the very center. You have very bright glowing light that's the material right before it's going to fall into the black hole. It heats up and glows and creates this jet that shoots out on either side. This was kind of the picture we thought might be going on. Now we go forward one, a little schematic of it. Now some folks said, well, you're going to have a relativistic jet, meaning it's going very close to the speed of light, the black hole down in there. You have a shock. Well, why would you have a shock? Well, sometimes material travels very fast and sometimes it interacts with material that's going slower. So they expect to see these sort of linear features deep down inside there as well. Well, the Event Horizon Telescope actually got some imaging from some of these. Well, let's, I think we're going to look at some other jets first, if I remember right. So let's go forward and look at some of these other jets. Here's the jet that's in M87. In fact, we have an image of M87 on our big picture, but if you image deep down in there, you can see a jet coming off of that black hole. That's the black hole that was imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. Stepping forward, we can see some other jets from quasars. This is the radio quasar 3C353. And again, looking deep down in there, we don't get a lot of resolution down in the core, but we see the jets coming off. Stepping forward again, we can take a look at the image that the Event Horizon Telescope took. So on the far left in the upper left corner is our broadest view, and you can see it looks kind of like a swath coming off of there, although you do see some sort of linear features in that diagonal jet that's coming off the brightest spot. There's that little linear feature. Maybe that's a shock. They zoomed in on the bright inner part, and you can indeed see some of these linear features that kind of go opposite the direction of the, the jet coming off the bright spot. Zooming in the last time to the big picture off on the right-hand side of this image, you can see what looks like a diagonal swath of light in the upper part with another swath of light that might be coming off of it. Now, this is very, very strange. And this is strange because we think we're staring straight down, only about two degrees off of that black hole. So we should be seeing the disk of the black hole. It should be round. And yet it's not. It looks like maybe it's tilted. So something is weird going on. Or maybe we're seeing the jet come off on weird directions and it's taking a turn. So they're not really sure what, what this image is showing. It's showing us unprecedented detail of where these jets are formed 
down in these supermassive black holes and it's not matching the simple picture that we thought should be happening. So very exciting to get more of these images. They're, in fact, there are going to be some changes to the Event Horizon Telescope when we step forward one. Um, we can take, oh no, here, this is even cooler. Sorry, I forgot this was in there, but I did add this at the last second. Um, if we look at this, they took time, the images over time, April 5th, 6th, 10th, and 11th, well, the blob at the bottom part is actually moving. You can see it slowly move away from the brightest blob at the top where the black hole would be. And if we go forward one more, you can add a line in there that shows it to you. That means that blob is moving at 0.995, 99.5% the speed of light. That is super cool. In fact, this displays what's known as superluminal motion. I don't have time to go into it tonight, but because of weird geometric effects, it actually appears to be looking like it's going faster than the speed of light because the blob is moving and then it emits light that doesn't have to go quite as far to get to us. So you get weird effects like that. But this just shows this indeed is going very close to the speed of light like we thought jets should do. So it did confirm one thing about these jets down near the black hole at the same time adding a bit of a mystery. So they're going to add some telescopes to the Event Horizon Telescope to try and figure out. Did you have a question, Lauren? Yeah, like I was just going to say, you, you, you know, it, it really brings home that every time you have an increase in technology, you find things you did not expect. Yeah. Because you're saying, well, what is with this weird bend? And, the, you know, it's not it's not what, what one would think. And uh, so it's just, it's, it's exciting because we have yeah. this new capability and every time it looks, I mean, it's still pretty new, but... Every time it looks at something, we're seeing amazing things and uh, changing our picture. So it's really great. So you were just about to say, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just was oh. excited about your story, um, you know, and, and they're going to make it even better. Yeah, they are. If we take, if we step forward one, we can see um, those green spots on there. Well, there's the South Pole Telescope. There's some others, but they are adding telescopes in there. I can't quite make it out on the resolution I have, but the new picture of the Event Horizon Telescope will be adding more dishes, which adds both collecting areas so they'll be able to add to their sensitivity but it also adds to the resolution a little bit eventually they would love to put a telescope up in orbit and have it swing very far from the earth and give you very long baselines which would give you even higher resolution so look for more great things from this collaboration of different observatories that all work together to create this event horizon telescope using interferometry which is a very very cool way to put telescopes together and then one more, one last story, completely different scale, but also made possible by a wonderful little telescope. Yeah, the, the Kepler Space Telescope, although it is retired, it was designed to go use the transit method to find planets. In fact, if you look out the direction it's pointing in this image, there's a little black spot on that star off the direction. That's, dem that's demonstrating the method. The planet passes in front of the star, dims the light a little, and it's able to detect exoplanets. And it found thousands and thousands of them, our most successful exoplanet detector to date. We step forward one, they're actually still finding exoplanets in the data. Well, this is Kepler 1649b. This is one we knew about. It's orbiting this star called Kepler 1649, and it orbits every 8.69 days. But look, it's only 2%-ish bigger than the Earth. Um, between 2 and about 8% is the range that I've seen. So very Earth-like in size. If we go forward slide, we can take a look at the orbit, however, a little bit. Well, there's the star down in the center, the little red thing, the Kepler planet B. The first one is in that inner orbit. It's kind of close to the star, but let's step forward one and get an artist's impression of what it might look like. Well, maybe it's somewhat Earth-like. Maybe it has clouds. It's Earth-sized, but it's bathed in that red light. And if we go forward one more... There it is compared to the Earth, almost identical, gives you hope. Could there be water? Could there be life? Is this the next place we can go? Well, probably not. We'll take one more look ahead and we can see it's too close to its star. It's the most inner orbit. It orbits very, very quickly. It's bathed in too much light. It's no good, but they did find another planet around it in the data when they went back and analyzed, went back and reanalyzed. Notice Kepler 1649c doesn't dip quite as much as the other one. The transit isn't quite as long, yet the planet is almost the same size. It's only 6% bigger than the Earth, yet it does orbit a little longer. It takes almost 20 days to go around, 19.5 days to orbit once, so it is further out. I'm imagining that it must just barely be clipping the star because it's not making as deep of an eclipse. Now, it is a little larger than the planet B, so it should create a deeper eclipse in my mind ever so slightly, but it's not. 
which is telling me it's probably clipping the star and we're lucky to still be seeing it. There is information about how these orbits are aligned. Anyway, let's go forward and take, take a look at the, the planet C. Again, could be Earth-like, bathed in that red light from the red dwarf star. We can set forward another one and see there is compared to Earth. Again, only 6% bigger than Earth. So maybe it could hold on to liquid water perhaps, but is it in that right range where water will stay liquid or will it be out where it'll vaporize if it's too close or will it be out where it's frozen if it's too cold? Let's take a look. We can step forward here. Indeed, it's just far enough away that we think the water could remain on the surface. It's in that habitable zone, which is super cool. So this exoplanet, although it was dug out of this Kepler data, they had to go looking for it, is probably the one that is most similar to Earth in terms of size and temperature when you compare the both and you use both of them. There are other exoplanets that are closer in size. In fact, planet B in the system is probably closer in size. But this one is in that habitable zone where maybe water could be liquid. Now, we don't know a lot of stuff about this. We don't know if it has an atmosphere. We don't know if it has lakes. We don't know any of that. These are all artists' impressions. But could there be hope? Well, what about that star? Here it is. You know, it's, it's a nice red dwarf. They last a very long time, trillions of years. But red dwarfs have a dark side to them. In fact, if we step forward one here, they have x-rays. They flare. They can be very bad places for a little planet that's trying to hold on to its atmosphere. It could get, you know, shocked over and over again by flares and x-rays. But we need to study this star more. We need to look into it. If it's old enough, maybe the flares have died down. Maybe it's a place you could have liquid water and potentially life. I don't know, but it's an excellent, exciting target to go study. And Kepler's still delivering. So there are other projects out there. There's tests. There's other ones coming. We're going to hear a lot about those. But Kepler, I'm always going to have a soft spot, soft spot right there for it because it's just, you know, it, it, we learned so much about the universe from this little telescope. It was such a well-conceived mission, you know, a just little telescope, but just focused on one goal and completely changed our understanding. I mean, for those who don't know, it just looked at one spot and just looked for planets. That's all it did. It wasn't looking, doing all kinds of pointing in different directions and looking at all kinds of different phenomena and just went looking for planets. And, and how? what's the total planet count that came from Kepler roughly? Oh gosh, I don't know, it's in the thousands. Um, I can look it up quickly, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, but uh, they, you know, thousands. And from those data, we were able to figure out that there's a planet, uh, at, there are more planets than stars in our galaxy, which is crazy. Cause you know, when I was in grad school, we hadn't found any planets, so. Kind of great. Yeah. Um, during its 9.6 years in orbit, 2,662 confirmed. And there's still many more candidates they're working on to see if they can confirm it. So it's it's un just under 3,000 on the graphic that was brought up. But of course, search a couple of minutes on the web, I can probably find six other numbers. Yeah. So That's one from NASA, though. So I tend to trust it. Speaking of things uh, from a while ago, even though grad school seems like it was just last week, um, 50 years ago, uh, you may know that we were right in the heart of uh, exploring the moon with astronauts and the Apollo program. So uh, if you are a fan of Griffith Observatory, a friend of ours, come to All Space Considered programs, you know that we've been having a years long celebration of all of the Apollo missions and um, celebrating each and every one uh, that uh, beginning with Apollo 8. Um, and so in April, we were all set to have our celebration for Apollo 13. Um, if you came to our Apollo 11 uh, program, you know that we had an engineer who worked on the lunar module who was very deeply involved in Apollo 13. And, um, and uh, both Tony and Patrick will tell you why the lunar module was so important when we get there. But uh, now, 50 years later, uh, you know, with these celebrations coming every every couple of months with a new mission, um, we should have done one on April 11th. But unfortunately, we were unable to do that. Everybody is staying safe and staying home. Uh, so instead, we thought we would take a little moment just to remind you all of the extraordinary um, mission of Apollo 13. Just to uh, briefly remind you, the basic picture here is that it launches from Earth, goes to the moon, orbits the moon, then land astronauts on the moon. And then a few uh, days later, the moon has changed position a little bit because the moon is orbiting Earth, take off from the moon and come back to Earth and land. And that's what all those Apollo uh, 
crewed missions look like. So um, we're all set to take off on Apollo 13. Um, and then the other little just background to give to you is that the Apollo spacecraft itself was made of three modules. On the right there, the little cone is the command module. That's where everybody hung out and there are three chairs, like the three bears, I don't know. Anyway, it's getting late. Not like three bears, like three astronauts. Um, and behind it, the service module that carried all of the life support and all the systems that kept them alive. And then the third module, as I mentioned earlier, the lunar module, the one that landed on the moon. So uh, these are, this is just a, um, a uh, sort of a graphical depiction of them. And here's an artist's conception that shows what it looked like when they actually go to the moon. You've got this triangle here is the command module, the service module behind with all the pay, uh, with all this life support and other systems. And then they actually turned the whole thing around and, and mate it with the lunar module. Um, and that's how they fly uh, to the moon. So that is the, that was the configuration for every Apollo mission and for Apollo 13 as well. So with that, I would like to uh, hand it over to um, Tony to tell us a little bit about some of the unusual things about this mission that distinguished it from others. Sure. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I, I forget. I've got it right in front of me. Um, right. Such an unusual mission. They made a movie about it. And if any of you have seen the movie, and it is really worth seeing, it's, uh, I remember going to see it with friends who were like, oh my gosh, I, I, a story that I know so well, and yet, yet it's completely gripping your edge of the seat for two hours on a story you already know. But anyway, see it if you haven't seen it. So with that, Tony, tell us about these three astronauts, one of which is not Tom Hanks, Bill Paxton, and yeah, okay. So originally, uh, well, first of all, the flight of Apollo 13 took place between April 11th and April 17th of 1970. And um, originally, the crew, up until three days before the launch, was going to be, as you see here, uh, 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 Jim Lovell, who was the command, I'm sorry, the commander of the mission. In the center was Tom Mattingly, who was the uh, command module pilot. Now he would be the same one, he would be the person who would stay in orbit around the moon while uh, Jim Lovell and his his lunar module pilot, uh, uh, Hayes, uh, I'm sorry, Fred Hayes, would uh, walk on the surface of the moon and then together they'd go back to Earth. But uh, three days before it was determined that uh, that Tom Mattingly had been exposed possibly to measles or rubella and um, even though he really didn't think he was sick, the doctor said, well, we can't let him go to the moon. It's too risky. So um, at the last minute, they brought in another, another astronaut to replace him. And that's the center person here. That's uh, uh, Jack, Jack, Jack Swaggart. I'm sorry, Jack Swaggart. And, uh, and uh, so it's very unusual in an Apollo mission to change a crew like this. Apollo 12, for instance, that crew had been friends for years and had trained together in a lot of different military and NASA missions. But here, it was a last minute change. Now, fortunately, Schweigert was one of the top astronauts of Apollo. So uh, Lovell okayed this as the commander because he, he knew that he would do a good job. And by the way, in the movie, that's probably the only really unrealistic thing is they kind of portray him as the newbie in the group and nobody really trusts him and stuff but that actually didn't happen anyway we'll go ahead <laughs> all right so the launch took place on the morning of uh, of april 11th 1970 with a huge saturn 5 you know 363 foot tall rocket and um and everything went fine for the first few minutes now uh, a few minutes about eight minutes into the launch uh, the second stage engine suddenly stopped working properly and the center uh, rocket of the five shut down two minutes early uh, for unknown reasons. So uh, the computer took over and got, got the uh, third stage with the, uh, with the Apollo into orbit, but it was uncertain whether they'd actually have enough fuel to make it to the moon. But if a little bit of number crunching by computers showed that they did. And it really turns out they were incredibly lucky even at that point. Later analysis showed that if the problem with the second stage had gone on even a few more seconds, it probably would have exploded and it would have been a tragic mission right from that point. 
but uh, the astronauts were actually unaware of that problem at the time. So actually after that, they fired up the third stage engine and what's called translunar injection and, and traveled out towards the moon. And actually on the second day of their mission, they figured they finished the TV broadcast. Things seemed to be going great. They were getting ready to relax for their last uh, sleep period before they reached the moon the next day. And uh, something happened and Patrick, what was that? Okay, so you can see from uh, the, the blue dot, uh, Apollo 13 was uh, within uh, 50,000 miles from the moon and ready to uh, enter the moon's uh, sphere of influence to be captured and uh, to orbit around the moon for the moon landing. But then um, the next thing uh, was a transmission came in at that point. And we're gonna go and look at the next slide here. Commander Lovell said, uh, I believe that we have a problem here. And then Houston uh, said, uh, this is Houston, uh, say again, please, uh, because they weren't really, they, the Capcom at that time was talking to someone else. And then in a firm voice, uh, Commander repeated, Houston, we have a problem. These were the famous words that changed the uh, course of the Apollo 13 mission. And you can see uh, he described a main uh, B uh, bus undervolt. Well, what, what was that? Well, that was a warning light. We go to the next slide that uh, appeared on the control panel indicating there was, uh, there was a problem with the uh, electrical system and uh, some of the electrical systems that were leading to the, uh, the life support system, the oxygen tanks and such. Um, just a, then the next transmission that came in was from the lunar uh, mo module pilot, uh, Fred Hayes, and, uh, and he reported the voltage was okay, uh, but they weren't sure. But the big part of it was, and we had a pretty loud bang associated with the caution and uh, warning uh, there. Actually, at that time, there was a, a, a large a bang that they heard that rippled through the command module and, uh, and through into the, uh, into the lunar module. And uh, there were all sorts of warning lights that were flashing. So even if that transmission was just a transmission of what, that really didn't convey the drama that was happening on the spacecraft at that time. So uh, let's go to uh, what really happened here. And uh, so an investigation uh, obviously was uh, conducted after the Apollo 13 mission. And it turned out uh, at that time that uh, number two oxygen tank exploded. You can see it in the diagram there. And uh, that explosion was so big that it uh, actually wiped out two of the three fuel cells on board uh, the command, uh, the service module. And uh, the only fuel cell that was, uh, that was still there was, the, uh, was fuel cell two. And that was, these are the batteries that provide the power to the uh, uh, command module. And uh, oxygen tank uh, number one was, uh, was uh, also damaged and was uh, venting out uh, precious oxygen into uh, space. So why did oxygen, okay. So that, that's what happened and, uh, and Tony, go ahead. So, so basically uh, this was stunning because the Apollo missions had gone pretty well, uh, you know, up to this point, the, the flown missions. And um, there was disbelief from ground control because it was showing three major systems with huge problems. They believed, well, you know, if it was one system, maybe they, maybe they could believe it, but Apollo was constructed with such redundancy that a lot of the people just didn't believe it was real, even though the astronauts had described a pretty big bang and all these lights are going off. And it wasn't until about 20 minutes into the confusion this caused that the commander uh, level looked out the window and actually saw stuff seeping out into space like a comet. And uh, that really dropped everybody's spirits because it really meant there was a physical problem with the spacecraft. So they also knew if they were leaking material that of course there was not gonna be any moon landing and they'd be lucky if they could make it back to earth because remember they're still heading out towards the moon. Um, so they had to think quick, and here's Gene Krantz, who was the most famous flight controller of this. Uh, 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 Looney was the other, and together they had to think up what to do, and they had to think fast. And there's one thing about flight controllers and astronauts, is they have to make right decision, decisions with available information in an incredibly short amount of time. 
And that's certainly the case here. Um, looking at what was going on, they decided they had to shut off all the power in the command module. And Apollo was not designed for that. It had computers that were necessary for guiding them, but they had to do without that. Otherwise they wouldn't have enough power if they got back to earth, to be able to control a landing. They decided the only situation they had was they had to use the lunar module as a lifeboat and control everything from there. They also knew that within five hours, they had to make an, a big engine burn in order to change the mission to get back to the Earth. If they didn't, the path they were on would just fling them in a big orbit that would miss the Earth. So, um, so they knew they had about five hours and it took a lot of scrambling, but um, they figured that if they could use the lunar module engine, they could fire it precisely just before they got to the moon and then use it to guide their way back to Earth. The problem is they didn't have a program for doing this. They didn't know if the lunar module could handle it. So they had to do a lot of calculations and they finally came up with, yes, the lunar module can do it. And uh, only one radio antenna in Australia actually could pick up the signal at this point because the main antenna wasn't working. So a lot of scrambling had minutes to spare and they were able to get the information to the astronauts on time. They fired their engine, changed the orbit, and then uh, approached the moon. So they saw the moon getting larger and larger and uh, finally went around the far side of the moon. Now Lovell had been to the moon before on Apollo 8. That was a mission without a lunar module where they uh, orbited the moon a few times before they came back to Earth. The very first time people had been to the moon. He'd seen it before. He was looking forward to walking on the moon. So he let the rookie astronauts get the best windows and, and see the moon because that was the closest they were likely to get to it. Um, after they passed around the moon, they, they realized they were short of supplies. They actually didn't have enough oxygen and other materials to keep them alive for the three days it would take to get back to Earth. So they had to fire the lunar module again and accelerate their path so they could cut 12 hours off from their flight time. Um, after that was successfully done, the astronauts were in miserable conditions. The atmosphere or the, the air inside got down to 38 degrees and they didn't have warm clothes. So, you know, if we get uncomfortable at, you know, like 60 degrees, imagine what it was like for days at 38 degrees. Things were slimy and wet inside from condensation, uh, just awful. And then, Patrick, there was another major problem that was happening. That's right. With uh, the lunar modules designed for uh, two astronauts, but all three of them were crammed inside. And, uh, and the command module's power system uh, was all, all shut down. And what they found was that uh, the carbon dioxide levels uh, in the air that they breathed uh, was uh, building up to dangerous levels. Even a warning light came on. So they had to quickly uh, find a way to, uh, to uh, absorb the carbon dioxide, which is done by these uh, canisters. In the lunar module, the hydroxide and they're round and they be they were used up, they were getting saturated. So they had to grab the canisters from the command module. Unfortunately, they were square. And in the famous uh, Apollo 13 mod, uh, a movie, it was trying to fit a, a round, a, a square into a round hole. So engineers had to uh, quickly get to work and devise a way to adapt a square uh, as a CO2 scrubber. And they came up with this, uh, device, which you can see in this image here. And they even had a diagram of it and they radioed the instructions to the astronauts, next slide, uh, where they uh, told them how to assemble it uh, just like a, a model kit. And here they are assembling it. And the next slide, uh, when it was all assembled, um, it actually worked. It brought down the carbon dioxide from a, a 5% uh, dangerous level to normal levels. And that, that was stuff that was totally unplanned from uh, map covers and duct tape and other stuff they knew that was on the spacecraft, but not intended for that use. Uh, and, and an astronaut uh, 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 sock and flight plan, plan as well. They, they ripped up their flight plan to uh, use, to make that. Uh, uh, I guess they didn't need it anymore, huh? No, <laughs> no. scrap the moon landing. Everything for, was for getting back to Earth. So basically, uh, the other big thing that would happen in the last hours was uh, getting ready to come back to Earth 
one of the problems was they didn't have a plan for powering up a command module. They knew they had very little power left and they needed a precise way to turn it on and only people on the ground could, could do that. So uh, uh, Mattingly, who didn't get to fly on this mission, was busy in simulators and led the, the effort to uh, learn how to power it up. And at the last possible minute, they, they radioed up the sequence that the astronauts had to use. That actually caused a lot of concern on board because without that, they wouldn't survive. They finally got it and they knew one of the things they do with, was they would cast off the service module and that would give an opportunity to uh, look at it. So uh, as this was going on, uh, Lovell and, and Hayes got in the lunar module and, and took pictures of the service module through the en engine. And if there was any excitement in Lovell's voice, it was when he saw the service module. He said, oh my, you know, we lost a whole side of the spacecraft. And uh, the damage was so bad, it actually raised the concern. Well, first of all, they could see why they had communication problems. The main antenna was bent back by the explosion. The, the uh, shelves inside the service module were all bent out of shape. And it was obvious why the fuel cells were damaged. And the, um, it, the danger was maybe the, the uh, heat shield of the command module was damaged. There was no way to tell. They couldn't see that, but it really made spirits drop to see how bad this explosion really had been. Um, it, recently, people have uh, used stacking techniques that we usually use on planets and stuff to put together frames that they shot of movies, and we now have sharper views that uh, we can now see that damage. Um, and then they cast off the Aquarius. The names of the spacecraft were Odyssey, who was the command module, and Aquarius was the lunar lander, their, their lifeboat. And of course, it would never land on the moon. It wasn't designed to come back to Earth, so it had no, no protection. Um, the command module was designed to withstand that 25,000 miles per hour if it could hit the atmosphere at exactly the right rate. But they had maneuvered it uh, by hook and by crook to, to get it to that point. So. Uh, then became the real nervous time. Uh, you know, the night before the Senate had passed a resolution that American businesses should close that night so people could pray. The Vatican got 10,000 people together. In India, 100,000 Hindus prayed for the Apollo 13. Everybody did what they could. And and Mission Control knew they had done everything they could they had to wait now, and the wait was very long. As the as the Apollo 13 hit the atmosphere of the Earth, the ionization of the atmosphere, the you know, stripping of electrons caused by the spacecraft, blocks out any radio message on any mission. So um, on Earth, we couldn't tell what was going on. Uh, people were worried about even the moisture in the spacecraft shorting out the electricity, but you know, because of the Apollo 1 fire, they had totally changed all the insulation on wires, so that didn't happen. But no one knew the condition of the crew. And finally, after this blackout period, people expected to hear the astronauts' voices, but there was silence on the radio for another 20 seconds. And then suddenly, uh, bursting out of the clouds, we could see parachutes. And uh, and the radio transmissions of the astronauts, they had made it. And uh, then they were able to reach the ocean. And they were rescued from the ocean by the aircraft carrier crew. Here's their splashdown. And then helicopters uh, went to the scene and got them. And I have to say, even the Soviet Union had scrambled ships because exactly where they were going to land you know, wasn't certain. So uh, even the Soviets helped and had ships ready to help rescue astronauts. And up to that point, we actually hadn't had much dealing with the Soviets with space. So that was a very positive thing. Um, today, you can see some uh, relics of Apollo 13. The capsule is at the Cosmosphere uh, and Space Center in Hutchinson, Kansas. And uh, the actual capsule that was used in, in the mission and the moon itself contains a, a, a relic. If we remember, uh, you know, 
the astronauts joined with the uh, lunar module and pulled it out of the third stage of the Saturn V, the third stage was under control from Earth and they, they actually reignited its engine and sent it to crash on the moon ahead of the astronauts arrival. So as the astronauts arrived at the moon, they, you know, they were desperately sa trying to save their lives. But meanwhile, the seismometer left months earlier on the, on the uh, Apollo 12 mission uh, nuclear powered recorded the impact of that Saturn V engine and, and it, it, it showed the jiggles. Now Apollo 11 had left one, but it was solar powered and it had died actually months earlier, but Apollo 12's worked. And Jim Lovell quipped, well, at least something on this mission worked, right? And uh, because Houston told him that they got that signal. So uh, the other thing is actually on the moon itself and that's that crater made by the S4B stage, the upper stage of Saturn V. So here is the crater that was discovered in 2009 by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, right where they expected that to be. Now, Jim Lovell is still with us, and he gave a uh, interview last week that was pretty funny. He said that, you know, after this flight, he and his crew were gathered together with the press, the head of NASA and stuff, and he'd already given indications that this was probably his last space flight. But he got thinking, you know, people asked him, are you going to go to the moon again? Are you going to try again? And he thought, you know, I could take this opportunity if only, you know, got everybody here. And he was uh, having these thoughts anyway. And suddenly he saw a hand go up in the back of the audience with a thumb up and the thumb turned around and went down. And he realized that was his wife. So I uh, guess, uh, no, no, I'm not going. <laughs> so, so he kept family harmony. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, of the crew, only, uh, 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 well, Mattingly, who didn't go on this mission, went uh, later on Apollo 16 as the command module pilot of that mission and orbited the moon while uh, other astronauts were on the surface. So anyway. So it was an amazing mission um, and it kind of breaks my heart and a lot of people's hearts to imagine that some people don't believe it happened. I think we all know Buzz Aldrin famously punched a guy out uh, yeah. who, who claimed we didn't go. So David, can you address that? Did we go to the moon yeah. or did we not? Yeah, very briefly, I'll, I'll address it. It was all faked in a studio just like this. Um, so no, we didn't. And no, in fact, there were, there were even some folks on our YouTube chat tonight that were doubting it, saying we can't get out of low Earth orbit. How could we have possibly gotten to the moon? So jokes aside that Doge directed it all, let's step forward and I can give you a few of the reasons. Um, if you want to see the long version of this presentation, by the way, we have copies on our YouTube channel. You can go and find it. But here's the quick rundown. Um, first of all, we built all this hardware. There were literally hundreds of thousands of engineers. I hear the number 400,000, but call it half a million people that worked on this program to make it happen. And every single one of them believed the technology they were working would get launched, would be able to get to orbit, would be able to have the astronauts in there. Nobody raised their hand and said, you know, this rubber seal will never work. That just didn't happen. They all thought it would work. And then on top of it, we launched the darn rocket. People could see it. All the data that as after that rocket was launched had to be faked. All those people looking at those screens and those data readouts all saw things they expected to see based on the systems they were monitoring. All of that data are saved. We can go back and look at it, but it actually is showing you all the readouts. There's people that have brought this back to life. Anyway, the hardware should have behaved like in the upper right-hand corner, and there were pictures from the ground showing the hardware behaving the way it should behave on its way to the moon. Um, and there were observers all over the world that were getting these sorts of images. In fact, the Russians had radio dishes like these on the ships that they were able to take out and put in positions to monitor the signals as they came from the spacecraft and listen in to every single transmission. So we had to fool the Russians by building a spacecraft and putting onto it all the transmissions that would have happened. They all had to be pre-recorded because the astronauts answered questions. All those questions had to be planned and pre-recorded and triggered somehow because we were gonna fool the Russians. So now instead of just sending some astronauts, you have to send a remote studio where you can trigger their answers at the right delay, at the right time on a spacecraft that's on its way to the moon because the Russians knew 
it was going to the moon. That's where the signals were coming from. So now let's step forward and see how harder it is to fake this. Um, we needed to build giant sets where we truck in huge rocks, multiple different color of dirt. Notice there's red dirt in there. There's dark gray dirt. There's light gray dirt. The moon isn't just one color. So if you bring all this stuff together, who trucked in all the dirt? You know, the truck drivers don't, don't make that much money. One of them would be really glad to tell the story and say, yeah, back in the 60s, I trucked tons and tons of dirt to this studio off in the Mojave Desert. What was it? No, nobody's ever telling any stories. They'd love to if they could. Um, and also, who's going to build a giant pit like that, like the crater? And we brought an electric car with us to the moon. Um, craziness. Um, you look at this picture, though, and you might wonder, and maybe you've heard, where are the stars? Ooh, this is a mystery. It must have all been faked if there are no stars in the pictures. And of course, NASA couldn't have figured that one out, that they needed to add stars into pictures. But besides that, little bit of the thing that maybe NASA would know that need to add stars if they should be there. Let's step forward and take a look at some pictures that I took um, of Griffith Observatory. Um, there's a short exposure. We can see well-lit things kind of nice. It's a very moody picture, but we don't see a whole lot. Stepping forward, that's a, light, a slightly longer exposure. You start to make out people on the steps of Griffith Observatory and that beautiful lattice work on our front, our front our, our front entrance there. Um, stepping forward one more, uh, now it's beginning to get a little bit overexposed where those lights are hitting the building, but we can make out the clouds and the dome of our planetarium in the background. And if we step one more, now with the longer exposure, we can see those clouds. We can even see a spot up in the clouds where a spotlight was shining, but we're totally overexposed and don't get any detail on the building where those lights are shining on the building. So your choice is you can either see the clouds or you can see the building. You can't do both. You cannot pick up very bright things and very faint things at the same time, even with a modern digital camera like this one. And the astronauts did not have modern digital cameras that have much greater ranges of sensitivity than the cameras they sent. And they sent very good cameras to the moon, but they had the choice to make. When you go to the moon, what do you want to take a picture of? And I think we step forward here. Do you want to get this picture? Do you want to see the moon's surface and the beautiful Earth? Or do you want to overexpose both of them and see the stars that are in the image? We could see the stars from Earth. This is the view you can't get. You go to the moon for this shot. So that's that's why there are no stars in the picture. Other folks might want to know, well, what about, um, I've heard that shadows do weird things. Let's take a look here. Here's an image, a bunch of shadows in there. They just look like shadows to me. But let's put some arrows on them. Those arrows seem to be pointing in weird directions. The one in the very bottom right the light's coming from a different direction than the ones at the very top of the image. How can that be? These must be some sort of spotlights that are illuminating this and very sensitive lighting to, to light it all up so they could fake it in the studio. Well, let's go forward and take a look at some images I took on a walk up to Griffith Observatory. Those shadows don't look like they're going the same direction. That's just perspective. Renaissance painters figured this stuff out hundreds of years ago. And again, on the right-hand side, those pillars, the bottom one, the, the shadow seems to be going up and down. As you get further and further away, the shadows seem to change direction. Also, relief, different height of land will make shadows do all sorts of weird things. Next time you're out and about, take a really good look at the shadows and see what you think. Um, they don't behave in simple ways like these arguments you see on the internet about the shadows on the moon, like people think they do. Um, the shadows behave completely normally. Let's go forward a slide here. And uh, oh, that's right. My next argument was we brought back rocks from the moon. These rocks were sent out to folks that wanted to analyze them. NASA didn't hide them away and keep them to ourselves. Researchers throughout the world asked to look at them and they saw things like those little micrometeorite craters you see on the right hand side. That little glass sphere even has a little crater on it. Well, that's from a little grain of sand flying through space impacting the moon, impacting the rock. These rocks all have micrometeorite impacts on them. Earth rocks don't have those because the little grain of sand burns up in our atmosphere as a beautiful shooting star. So shooting stars, if they make it to the ground, the rock is usually pretty big and it does an air burst and they certainly don't have micrometeorite impacts on them like these lunar rocks do. So yeah, these were brought back from the moon. You don't, they, they, Earth weathers them. Too much water, too much air, wind, all of that. We don't end up with things that look like it. Let's step forward again to the next slide. Um, well, we've imaged the landing sites from orbit. Now, you can't image them from here on Earth. People often ask us, can you point our 12-inch sights at it? I have asked Tony, and he says, no, not going to work. If we make it a mile wide, maybe with adaptive optics, we might have a shot. But we don't have room for that at Griffith Observatory. So instead, NASA sent a 12-inch telescope, same size as our Zeiss, to the moon and imaged the landing sites. And you can see stuff was left behind. 
we go forward one, we can look at the descent part. I, uh, go forward one more, we'll label everything. Um, this was Apollo 17. You can see the Challenger descent stage there. You can see the all set, that's some instruments that were left behind. Those trails that are there are actually where the astronauts walked around and where they drove around. Some of them are double tracks. You can see they're left from tires. So now you could say this was a NASA image. They faked this as well, but the Japanese have imaged the surface of the moon. There's evidence that, that stuff was disturbed where they looked. So either they're in on it as well. Um, the Chinese have gone to the moon. They've imaged it and they've never said the, the United States didn't go. They have no interest in faking it for us. So, and then lastly, if we go forward here, take a look. Why would we fake a failure? How does that help the reputation of the United States at all? Let's just stop and think about this for a second. We faked a failure where we had to record all those signals, all those messages, all that stuff about how to make a thing that's going to cleanse the atmosphere, everything that Tony told you about, all that had to be pre-prepared, scripted, put onto the thing, flown to the moon, looped around the moon, the transmission's happening at the right time. How does that make the United States look better? Tell me that and maybe I'll listen to your we hoaxed it one more time. But until you can explain why faking it and making ourselves look like fools that maybe aren't going to be able to get there quite right, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Really, it goes to show how darn hard it is to go to the moon. Folks say we can't get out of low Earth orbit. Well, we can. Elon Musk launched a car. It went out to Mars's orbit. And the Orion spacecraft is in its final stages of being created. It had a test mission where they flung it out and it came back in. So, yeah, our space program has taken a little bit of a pause. But anyway, we might, you know, there, there's a future if I, if I hear things correctly. So we went to the moon. It wasn't faked. This is, you know, it's fun to give this talk, but it is a little disappointing to see people uh, still believe that we faked it, but gives me purpose in these Apollo presentations. So I'll take it. Yeah, I have to say it's frustrating um, because, of course, the uh, people involved, the reason Buzz Aldrin punched out the guys because, you know, they put their lives on the line. They gave their lives to this very uh, extremely noble cause and succeeded and deserve the kind of um, accolades that, in fact, the, the globe gave them when they all came home mission after mission, even though the program for many of us ended too soon. So certainly American uh, launch capability is a point of pride for us. And uh, we took great pride in the extraordinary um, uh, spacecraft that followed the, the space shuttle. Um, so I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware that the space shuttle uh, was flying for, gosh, how many total years? Maybe almost 20 years, I think. Maybe a little bit less than that. Um, no, actually more than that. Uh, wow, almost 30 years. 20, uh, 1980, I think, was the first one, and 2011 was the last one. So, right. boy, how time flies. Um, it was 30 years. It was 81. To 81? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so um, it, it had a long run and was an amazing machine, but it, the, the time came when, uh, when we uh, needed to move on. So the American Space Shuttle was retired, and it, there you can see it's having a lovely time on a golf course in Florida. Um, and so for most of the last decade, we have been uh, dependent on the Russians to get us to and from the International Space Station. And uh, in fact, we just had a crew come back, I think last week, uh, from the International Space Station. So this has been a, a goal for quite some time for NASA to be able to return to the days when we could launch American astronauts from American soil. And two uh, simultaneous side-by-side -side programs were uh, initiated, one with Boeing, its Starliner, and the other with SpaceX, its crew capsule. And this image shows you um, not only the two mock-ups of the hardware, it's taken about a year, a little over a year ago, but also the astronauts that have been selected to fly in those two different uh, spacecraft. So um, both teams separately, independently, um, moved uh, forward in developing their spacecraft. Some like to characterize it as a little bit of a race. You know, you've got the two different teams competing. Yes, they're competing. There's also, I mean, it's all NASA. So there's, um, it, you know, we all have the same goal. Uh, and uh, so at the end of last year, there was, uh, it was kind of neck and neck for a while, but at the end of the last year, uh, Boeing's attempt to get to the International Space Station was thwarted. They were unable to get their uh, crew capsule, their, 
Starliner up to the International Space Station. They had a problem at launch. Um, Elon Musk's a crew capsule, uncrewed with no one in it, but uh, did actually earlier that year um, successfully get there. And then in January, uh, the final test for SpaceX for the crew emergency escape uh, capability took place. And um, that was uh, a great success. I, oh, there we go. Um, so as of January, it was pretty clear that uh, SpaceX will be likely be the uh, company that gets the first American astronauts uh, sent from American soil back up to the International Space Station. So here we have the, the uh, Dragon crew capsule. There's a nice um, picture of it in the uh, SpaceX uh, clean room or uh, facility. And uh, just a little while ago, I guess we're looking on, um, what's the date on that? April 17th, not too long yeah. ago. Um, but Jim Bridenstine uh, tweeted the launch date, May 27th um, of this year, the uh, space shuttle, space shuttle, good heavens, the uh, um, SpaceX crew capsule, Dragon Crew, is scheduled to launch with astronauts to the International Space Station. And here are the uh, astronauts that are slated to go on the, that first flight. Um, they, in fact, Doug Hurley was the pilot on the last Atlantis flight. So um, these are NASA astronauts flying just new hardware procure, procured from NASA through SpaceX, but built entirely, designed and built entirely uh, at SpaceX. So um, here is their mission patch and um, the first crewed flight back to um, the International Space Station. Here's another picture of them in these very cool and groovy um, space outfits. <laughs> space outfits, I guess I should call it. I mean, it's getting later and later. And uh, a shot of them walking down. They actually, uh, SpaceX also has a different gantry, uh, the, the walkway from the tower when the astronauts have to walk out to uh, where the um, capsule sits on top of, of the rocket uh, is also newly designed and has kind of a nice, clean, modern design. So uh, the astronauts are in quarantine preparing to go uh, so that they don't get sick and bring any bugs up to the International Space Station, but it is still on the docket. And in fact, uh, today was an important day because um, there was a critical test of the Dragon parachute. And Tony sent this to me just a little bit. You can see it's from today at just a little afternoon that the uh, parachute test was a success. And uh, so that was kind of another key thing to get us to May 27th and the launch of, um, of these astronauts. So we will um, be looking to May 27th for a launch. And, um, and uh, I guess we've got a little picture of Jim Bridenstine there because he is strongly encouraging everybody to stay home, do not go to the launch. It'd be a, obviously an historic flight, something you might want to see, but he wants us to stay home and uh, stay safe in your jammies and uh, not go down to see the International Space Station, um, see the launch, uh, the crew Dragon launch to the International Space Station. A couple of years ago, there was kind of a joke when we weren't getting um, astronauts off of American soil uh, that perhaps we needed to have a, a, a big trampoline for our NASA astronauts. But in fact, we don't need a large trampoline. We have a, a mission uh, slated to go in this month. So we'll keep our eyes out on that. Hope that everything keeps going. It's amazing that NASA is able to continue to um, do all this work and keep it all, has got to keep it all going um, in the face of all of this uh, shutdown. So um, something to keep your eyes on this month. And there is one last story, Tony, from uh, SpaceX, I think, that you were going to share with us. Yes. Um, okay. So um, SpaceX is also planning on uh, launching, or they're planning, they're actually in the midst of building Starship, which is a gigantic uh, craft to carry people across the solar system. Um, and uh, so in Texas, they're, they've been building these. And we've been covering uh, the story because they're building them quickly and letting them fail. They want to learn from these failures. So three times in a row, the fuel tanks from, from the, the spaceship or the Starship have uh, either collapsed under their own weight or under the pressure inside them and stuff. So the, this uh, fourth one now 
uh, seems to be working great. They, they pressurized it a few nights ago and, uh, and this one didn't burst. It has an engine attached to it. Uh, originally tonight they were hoping to test the engine, but for some reason, maybe due to weather or something that was called off, but watch for that this weekend, they're going to fire this up. And then shortly after that, they hope to actually launch it, uh, more than a hundred feet up and then it will land. And then they'll fly another one they're already building. And just today it was announced by, uh, Jim Bridenstine, the, uh, the, uh, administrator of NASA that SpaceX is one of three companies that have been given contracts to land people on the moon by 2024. And the Starship is one of the, the craft that could uh, send people to the moon. The interesting thing is Starship can do that self-contained. It doesn't depend on any of the other infrastructure that's being developed for lunar travel. So uh, that puts extra interest on this. Musk is mainly interested in Starship for getting people to Mars, but, uh, but it's exciting. The stuff's actually really happening fast. Uh, if any of you are actually doubters in moon stuff, keep watching the sky. <laughs> Get your own evidence. <laughs> Buy a ticket. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah, that day is coming too. So uh, we have come to the end of our show and we like to end the first half usually, but we didn't take a break with a series of pretty pictures. So if you're at home, turn off your lights, get a nice dark room so that you've got a lovely view. I am uh, i don't think I, I have to have to walk away and deal with lights, so I'll keep my lights on. But here are a couple uh, pretty pictures to end your evening with. Um, the first was taken by uh, our own Blake Ed, uh, Estes, who's a telescope demonstrator. That is an asteroid that just had a close approach, comparatively close. It was several times the distance of the moon, posed no threat to us whatsoever, but still a very bright asteroid uh, crossing through the sky. And as you can see, um, he took a lovely little um, video of that. Another one of our telescope demonstrators took a series of images as well. Oh, that's gonna keep beeping. My, my sous vide pork shoulder is done. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, I may have to go stop it because that'll make us all crazy. Um, anyway, oh dear. Um, Matthew, if you can hear me, sorry, I thought we'd be done by now. Matthew, if you could, uh, if you could take over control of the slides and, uh, and there we go. Great. I'll let you guys talk. Here's, here's a, just a time-lapse of, uh, his images. Yeah. So, uh, Actually, uh, Anthony is a telescope demonstrator at the observatory, as is Blake. So they, they're actually staff that um, I manage, but they're incredibly talented amateur astronomers and um, they've been feeding us a lot of great images. Uh, Blake also works up at Mount Wilson. So he, he has a telescope up there, uh, his own personal one that he uses for the kind of photography. Um, in this one, uh, I don't have my thing zoomed in. I, I can do it. I'm back. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Cooking real time. Uh, yeah, that was the accidental delivery. Anyway, oh, that's it. Everyone's invited, right? What? Everyone's invited, right? All our listeners. Yeah, exactly. Oh. This is actually a picture I took of the uh, crescent moon and um, and Venus. And it was a beautiful evening. And in fact, uh, just a few minutes earlier, this was probably around 8.30, uh, but about eight o'clock that same evening, this is what uh, the scene was. Hmm, all right. Yeah, so if you have your own neighborhood, uh, similar kinds of things, you know uh, what I'm talking about. It's kind of an amazing scene at eight o'clock at night around here. Um, and uh, that same evening, Patrick took this and yes, was it? Able... Yeah, then, and this is the same picture I showed in the sky report with uh, Venus uh, uh, kind of at top there and uh, a 2% crescent moon near the horizon. There we go. Awesome. And also this next one, I think because I had Matthew advancing slides now, I've messed up who's controlling it. Um, so Matthew, oh dear. Um, so let's see if this does it. 
Yeah, that we also saw this, which was Tony's picture of Venus. That was about a week ago. Yeah. Um, and here is a, a beautiful image taken again by uh, telescope demonstrator Anthony of the night of the Lyrid meteor uh, shower. So here's a beautiful picture of the Milky Way and you can see right at the bottom if we zoom in, a very nice Lyrid meteor. He also got one, he was taking a long exposure on this globular cluster and you can see the swoosh on the upper right was a, was a sort of a vapor trail um, from another Lyrid. So he was quite uh, happy to have gotten that shot. This shot, Tony, do you want to tell us about this? It was uh, earlier this year, uh, just before dawn, uh, earlier this month, I mean, uh, with that amazing uh, lineup of planets that Patrick was talking uh, about. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars have been forming a line in the uh, up east sky since spring. And uh, Patrick told us about this. The moon passed by in, in mid-April. And um, the uh, photographer in New Jersey, and I can't read, unfortunately, I don't have the zoomed in. Can you see his name? Yes, yeah. Alexander Krivenstichev. Yes, he, he just invited us to use his beautiful pictures that he took. And uh, this is from his apartment in New Jersey, looking at New York City and uh, at the planet alignment. And he does a lot of wonderful photography on, you can see on his website. Both Katie and I, Katie, I hope you don't mind me out, outing you, but when we were putting this together this morning, we uh, both got choked up over this image. Um, I think it will seem like a real, um, a very, it'll be a strong memory uh, when this whole thing is over. And, yeah. uh, but still yeah. the beauty is there in the sky and the beauty of people's desire to capture it and be part of it. And, uh, you know, I think it's pretty much worldwide because people aren't driving around and stuff as much. The sky is much, much better for viewing stars now than usual because of no pollution. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, this is an image of uh, Venus passing the Pleiades uh, just last month. Uh, it took, uh, I took them, uh, an image every night uh, for six nights. And, uh, this was an image also of the Pleiades uh, and the and Venus going past. Oh dear, maybe I'm not controlling it anymore. I think that's Comet Atlas. It is, but I, I'm not controlling it. So I clicked on a different one, it's fine. This is Comet Atlas, uh, same thing taken by our own staff. Um, and so I'm gonna just move through this. We've talked a lot about Comet Atlas earlier tonight, so uh, we won't take more time at the moment, but it's kind of cool to see the comet that was supposed to be uh, so fantastic. And then here's the picture of Venus and the Pleiades with an extra bonus of the International Space Station um, <laughs> crossing through the field. So that's kind of a very cool photograph. Um, and then finally, a few pretty pictures from the astro astronomical picture of the day. And if you don't know that, you may want to set it uh, as a, um, you know, a, a default website to go to because it's filled with absolutely beautiful astronomical images as the name implies. Um, so uh, we have a galaxy and a cluster, with some beautiful stars. Those colors do represent different temperatured stars. Here's an old picture, but newly uh, gussied up of um, the moon Enceladus around Saturn and the cracks in its uh, in its surface that through which jets of material shoot out into space. And this next one is um, the Hubble uh, 30th anniversary. I should be able to know this. I was at Hubble at the time, 90, yeah, 30 years. <laughs> 30 years uh, since the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, absolutely beautiful image of um, a very hot star um, and uh, some nebulosity. This one also coming from the astronomical picture of the day uh, is a um, fisheye view of the Milky Way and that's a lagoon. Apparently this is the way it was posted. So um, both Katie and I, when we were going through these today thought I, I have to see it the right way because just my brain wants me to turn it. Um, a beautiful fisheye image. Star trails and a windmill. Another oldie but beautiful, the Horsehead Nebula. And a very uh, lovely 
edge on, nearly edge on Galaxy NGC 253, one of my favorites from grad school. Um, and then our final picture, just going back to something that Tony uh, and Patrick shared earlier, is a uh, comet swan. So maybe you will get a chance, especially if you have anyone tuned in from the Southern Hemisphere to see it in the morning sky. And uh, with that, um, you turn the lights back on and uh, we wish you a lovely evening, but we will stick around since we kind of buzzed through and didn't take any of your questions and I did get notifications, but I was interested to make sure we could, you know, get you to the buses by 10 o'clock and, you know, you have to be out of the park because the gates closed to the park. So, um, at least that's what people we're, we're so bad about staying late before they've closed the park. I know. Anyway, nobody can go there now. So um, with that, I, I do want to thank everyone who tuned in tonight. It's really, um, thank you for your patience as we try to figure this out. And, uh, and oh, uh, production staff, gang, friends, come on back into the room. And if there are any questions, um, please do tell us uh, what they were and we'll be happy. You all know Bill. I don't know if you all know Hannah. Uh, she's often behind the camera in the in the theater. Brendan is often behind the camera, but you also saw him singing today. Angelica, Daniel, and um, uh, Jeff are always uh, busy creating beautiful imagery. Katie, our producer, and uh, Sarah as video editor, and Molly. I don't know if they're around there. They are. There's Sarah and Molly. So um, were there any questions? Tell us about how was, how was the chat? And are there any questions you would like us to field? Well, the chat was lovely. Everything, uh, you know, it was just a whole lot of fun. Um, we do have a couple questions that we saved up uh, for the end. So if we can give those to you, it's only a couple, uh, but I'm sure the people, if they're still there, would love to hear some answers. Uh, so our first question is from Ed. Uh, he wants to know if there is a good strategy to find comets in the sky using a go-to telescope. Uh, so one of his telescopes at home, he doesn't have uh, access to programming that'll, you know, give him uh, where comets are. Is there another way to find those sorts of things? Tony, I think that's a you question. Yeah, um, geez, you know, I'll, I would just suggest looking for comets on where Google. Are. There are uh, actually sites that um, show you, you know, live positions. I mean, one of them is Heavens Above, which we use for satellite position. They have a comet thing, but there are apps that will actually show you live updated information on where to point your telescope. So I assume you're, you're looking for the coordinates because you can add that into your telescope, you know, the right ascension and declination and, and, and then it will go there. So there are actually a number of sites on the web. I wish I knew their names because I, I other than heavens above is one of them, but, uh, if you just search comet positions in Google, you will hit most of the major sites. Just take a look at those. And uh, some of them are more intuitive than others, but that's what I would do <laughs> actually. But you will find that information. If you can't, feel free to email me. And I'll, I'll give my, I, I'm on uh, you know, our sky report. So if you look at Griffith Observatory sky report, um, my email contact is there. Just feel free to ask, I'll, and I'll do more research for you. And uh, I'll, I'm, I'm scrolling back just to get all of our contact info. So, you know, uh, a fun way, we love to hear from you in our social media. So if you tweet at us, uh, we are happy to take questions through Twitter as well. Uh Another question uh, that we have is from Tad. Um, he is asking, this is to Patrick's story about the telescope on the moon. Are there any private companies uh, that are looking into the moon telescope idea? I'm uh, not aware of any uh, at this time. I mean, that there have been concepts um, in the past for, uh, for lunar telescopes, but they're mostly uh, through uh, NASA. But um, yeah, I don't know at this time. You know, there was the Lunar X Prize a while ago, which uh, had a competition for um, private companies and individuals even to, you know, groups of individuals to uh, build lunar missions. Um, and that prize is uh, concluded now, but, um, but I think there's plenty of opportunity and room, lots of entrepreneurs interested in doing things like that, because um, it's kind of a new, not to sound corny, but frontier in that way. 
And as for questions, those are the only two that I noticed, uh, but some of our other moderators might have picked up on others. Does anybody else have a question that I might have missed? Okay. Well, I do want to say I love your outfit there, um, David, especially we just got a glimpse of your uh, basketball shorts. <laughs> oh, do you? Awesome. See, yes. It's, all, it's only complete if you're wearing basketball shorts with your rotate jacket. <laughs> And, and for the record, uh, I am too. I mean, I'm not wearing as quite as fancy. <laughs> okay, I'm, I, I'm I was pants. <laughs> I was more amused that my dog has climbed up on the couch and I've taken the blankets off that protect it from him. He's really enjoying it. He's like, this is luxury. That's so funny. What a good boy. Oh, yeah, right. Good boy. Oh, and, uh, and I think your cat stood up just uh, right now. She's thinking, you talking to me? Of course. So um, I, I want to say a, a huge thank you to our team, um, all of whom you can see here. Uh, it's, <laughs> this has not been easy. Uh, it happened very suddenly. We were shut down and that was that. And we had to make up everything from scratch. And uh, so I want to just uh, say a huge thank you to all of the faces that you see on the screen. You always see David and Patrick and Tony and me, but, um, but you know, it's, it's the rest of them that's making that um, happen. And uh, so thank you to all of you. And um, um, Matthew in the background. <laughs> Matthew, why don't you, are you willing to show your face? In fact, Matthew, go, can you, um, can you full screen the All Space Considered with a social media and, and email address there? Um, I wonder if I'm able to, no, you guys don't see me. Um, I don't know if he's can hear us. So now I don't, I don't know if I want to scare you, anybody that was on here, but did you know we had over 400 people watching at one point? <laughs> that's, that's double of what we can get in the LNEH. Yeah, that's right. So Matthew, oh my gosh, there's Matthew who is in the observatory tonight, braved it, crashed through the barriers that, uh, no, he didn't have to crash through. He has a badge, but, um, you know, again, also could not do this without Matthew. So I'm, I'm actually really happy. One of the nice, another silver lining here is that we get to see everybody. Usually you guys are sitting in the back in the dark in the theater or the control room. We never get to really see you and, uh, and say thank you. So that's really great. So, um, you know, uh, <laughs> this was supposed to be a short show, <laughs> our trial. So we learned a number of things. Um, and uh, I think maybe we're gonna try to do more and uh, if there are any of you have specific uh, interests or desires to have, you know, opportunities to talk about space, hear more about space, learn more about Griffith Observatory, um, you know, we're here for you. We're not physically here. You can't come up the hill, um, but we're physically here in our living rooms and, um, and everybody's, um, we miss you. We miss each other and we miss being at the observatory. So hopefully uh, this will come to an end in a safe and uh, time soon um, and we can all be together again. But uh, until then, we'll try to make it happen in, uh, in this virtual realm. So um, good night to everybody and thank you. And we'll Thanks, everybody. see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye.